And we're live with Carol Linden, who I consider a type expert, professional in the type community, teaches interaction styles and temperament and things like that, and has been trained by uh, Linda Berens. We have Shalina here, who is, I won't call her an expert, but I will call her a Jungian buff. <laughs> She's read quite a lot of Jung's texts and those of his disciples. Uh, I think it's Von Franz and uh, Van der Hoop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we have um, Rachel here, who some silly people have typed as ENFP. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Carol here also resembles ENFP, but I believe that she is more um, uh, ENFJ. And in fact, we will, and we have Shannon here, who resembles uh, ISFP. Uh, she relates to the artisan temperament, but also, interestingly, to ESI which is a type that's a little bit more like a six and a little bit wary. Uh, but so it's almost as if Shannon has like her counterphobic moments are like artisan and her phobic moments are like ESI, which Victor even calls the guardian. So what we could do is uh, we could start with Carol talking about your experience with TI and then we could actually start with Rachel's experience with it because then you've got an example of somebody who is ti trickster ti break and then someone who i think in rachel's case uh, resembles enfj and is ti suggestive so we can sort of like compare those two and then we'll get into the theory because this is more personal to start with so over to you carol okay um having enfp preferences uh, introverted thinking is in my seventh preference and i was just sharing with ben earlier Ben, can you hear me? Your eyebrows are looking very worried. Yeah, yes, yes. I look worried because my um, my eyebrows are looking worried. Fantastic. Okay. My brows are crashed and I was wondering, where is my shit? My, not my sheen, my screen that I'm sharing. Uh, but okay. that, is, that is not a problem because we're in the personal <laughs> section. Okay. <laughs> um, I it's, in, it's my trick question. So I had to go read Mark Huntinger and Leona Haas's book and I just devoured their chapter on introverted because I just couldn't grasp it. And yeah. their book, I've got that whole chapter just all highlighted. And Linda Behrens and, and uh, John Beebe teaching me that introverted thinking is like building a model in your head and everything gets checked out against the model. And if it checks out, you're okay and you go. If it doesn't check out, wait, we gotta, either it's gone or we gotta redo the model. And that's very different from extroverted thinking and in my former life, I was a learning uh, learning performance professional in a software company. And one of the things I had to help IT groups with is they had a lot of uh, NTJs and FTJs, and then they had the ISTPs and the ISTPs. So they had introverted thinking and extroverted thinking. And they were just like having collisions all the time. And I taught the difference between introverted thinking and extroverted thinking. It, it made so much sense to them. Uh, I really very much value being taught eight months and how it's not just theory, how it really makes a difference. Real quick, I'm making a fucking note. Uh, Shalina, we can hear you at the moment uh, whilst you are <laughs> discussing things. So, um, so uh, if you press control D, you can mute your mic and there is uh, what I will do is I will be a legend, and whilst whilst certain things are going on, I will mute Shalina, and then when she comes back, I there we go. There okay, we go. I'm, a, I'm a I'm a gentleman. Very well. Like, the example I did that that helped them that I just kept doing over and over. So I would explain that the extrovert person using extroverted thinking wants to talk about what we're going to do and when we're going to do it, and they want commitments, and it's about execute. Extroverted yeah. thinking is about how we're going to execute this. And introverted thinking is, wait, I can't move forward to the model in my head works. So the introverted thinkers kept going, but, but, this, but that. And what they end up with is the, the, the TJ manager thinking, oh, this person's not a player. They're just being difficult. They're not willing to move forward. And so I explained to them, the person using introverted thinking is trying very hard to move forward with you. They just can't move forward to the model in their head works. But that can be misunderstood as resistance and not being a team player and not being willing. So what I mainly extroverted thinking dominant managers, how to make space 
and stop the scheduling quest execution question and have the understanding question help get the model right then you can have the ENT the INT programmer to move forward but until then they were just like bumping heads and didn't understand why Does that makes sense and you're still looking for it. yeah I'm um, uh yeah I was just uh, looking at um I was just trying trying to share something but I think that would have been a been uh off topic because it would it would it would it would have got yeah yeah it made sense and I was thinking about that I was sort of comparing how say INTP TINX in my terminology uh would they can get to a point where they can seem quite rigid and it's like this doesn't fit the model and then you could also have ESTJ over here and says this doesn't fit standard operating procedure so they can both seem quite rigid uh, in that way it's just that with it's almost as if it's not quite built on like a feet of clay or like on sand but a lot of these models are built on but and i was saying this before when we before we started that a lot of times i think the the iron the intps especially think that they can take a premise and then through developing it into a logical structure almost as if using the logical structure structure to prove the premise now of course a little bit of maturity and health will come in here in terms of are they going to have confirmation bias to like like only pick those things that fit the model and this is where you get um in science where you got Karl popper coming out with a proper scientific method where as soon as you somebody comes up with a theory the object is to disprove that theory and the theory is never proven it only reaches the status of undisproven and then eventually generally accepted and then i suppose that theory then achieves the status of te once it's been accepted by because it's what most people think it's like with newton and gravity that becomes the te and then eventually because that's another aspect of the te is that it's either objective in terms of empirical or it's what is taken to be true by most people and you get that with more of the sjs because they're more the more like that just from their temperament reasons they're more to be that more like and so most tj users are going to be sjs they're going to be going towards the standard operating procedure this is how you do it and um that and is doing it talk, talking about it so we can do it and accomplish it yeah rather than it's not that they don't want understanding but their language is all about closure execution and closure and what we're going to make happen whereas the introverted language is used here to grab with it and understand it so uh, just to so i i think that models are based on a on a subjective basis so for instance jeff would say when he read there's a, there's a little bit of a um shalina's got headphones in everyone's got headphones in but there's a little bit of something in the back oh, okay. hold on it might be my fan no it's a, it's a little like echo oh okay so your fan is fine well, yeah, but i don't know where it came from yeah i think we're all right now um yeah sounds good um, now uh what was i saying oh yeah so oh so jeff, yeah, yeah that's it jeff would say that so now that he's read psychological types he would say that he gets annoyed that well jung didn't write anything about these models well the most he did was lead function inferior function auxiliary function and he hinted at what's the big one called is it called opposing personality like the other side um, of the lead he, yeah, sort of, he sort of hinted at that that's BB's interpretation, yeah, right? Yeah. Furthering, it, furthering your thought. Yeah, and, and you'll see that when we go through T E and T I here, he definitely writes about the other side. So he hints at that, but I don't think he mentioned the tertiary function in psychological types. He mentioned it elsewhere, though, right, in another yeah. lecture. Yeah. Well so, done. Good. Thank you. Yeah, she knows her stuff. Um, but so Jeff would say it's like, well, so this is most of more because there's a difference between the TI break of ESFP versus the TI break of ENFP because ENFP is abstract. 
yeah. ESFP yeah. isn't. So Model G, I think, picks this up quite nicely where it's like ESFPs do not like the theoretical stuff unless it's got a practical application and works. So with Jeff, he, had, he was resistant to Kersey temperament theory at first. It was like, oh, who's this, who's this old guy who thinks he knows me? But it's like because he connected it with so much, it was like, damn it. <laughs> it works. Whereas I found Kersey in my 30s and it was like, oh, my God, here's somebody explaining reality to me. Mm. As an ENFP, Kersey made perfect sense. And I was not like anybody else in my environment. So it was astonishing to read that. It like made sense of the world to me. Ben, I think the echo is coming from me. Yeah, there's a weird echo. I don't believe it's me. No, um, I think it came um, from me when I put the mic in. Well, if I turn down my volume, I don't know if, uh, how about now? Okay, let's check. No, it's no still a little bit. Because I, I don't at, hear an echo on my end. So maybe it's oh. me. <laughs> yeah, it's, only, it's only very slight. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you, you plug, as long as you're plugged in, Shalina, then there's no thing of the sound coming out the speaker and then going back into yeah, the Yeah, it's plugged in, yeah. Yeah, so you're fine there. So, yeah, I've just sometimes things come up, I sort of noodle on things and things come up as I think about it. And I was thinking about um, how ENFPs are theoretically TI break. And I think it might be... Do you was your initial resistance to a model, Carol, that you thought it was restrictive? To no, because it made so much sense of things that had been difficult for me, and I didn't understand why. It gave me so much clarity and explained reality to me yeah. that I just drank it. I just drank it up. I just loved Kirsi. It just oh, yeah. made, It was so useful. But in general, when you, were, when you were resistant to TI and somebody was teaching you a model, I would imagine, I'm just sort of thinking about this now, that any NFP might think, yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And what about this situation? That doesn't fit the model. I wonder if you were thinking about like that, like you were resistant to a model in that maybe it was restricted because you might have seen errors. Because I'm trying to wonder what you were like before you developed more of a I don't, understanding. I don't, think, yeah. I don't think models are a problem for me. And you're helping me. I'm talking out loud here because you're helping me see this. Models, if they give clarity and help me understand something better, I love it. Rules, I have a problem with them. Right. Not models. models and rules are different things. Models That's restrict me. Rules give me, I mean, rules restrict me. Models give me clarity. Yeah, that's one of the things that's good in the definition where Victor has these uh, these spins where uh, I won't show it on screen, but ultimately what it has is for ENFP, he says that TI break in the sense that ENFPs are not particularly good at following a rigid structure. Now, uh, ESFPs are TI break, in fact, of it's like they don't like the overly theoretical stuff if there's no practical uh, application uh, for it. I actually have a thought about that Go on. really quick. I have a question first. When you're talking about ESFPs and theoretical stuff, do you mean like getting deep into them, like making them important or like believing in them or just having conversation about them in like normal everyday conversation? Because I actually read something about SE dominance where they can entertain anything just to talk, though, just mm -hmm. so they won't be bored. Yeah, I can see that. Um, ESFP will, if if they find the conversation interesting, then they'll talk about pretty much anything. It's well, certain things are easier to understand than others. Go on, Cal. I well, I have a excuse me. I was I was part of the problem. It wasn't on the headset, and now it is. So. It's cleared up on my end now. Is it cleared up on yours? Right. So it's coming up. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. Gotcha. My, my, my bad. That's okay. um, I have a, 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 a childhood friend. I call my adopted sister. She, I, I have ENFP preferences and she has e, 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 ESFP. So it, me as the NFP, I became the Myers-Briggs teacher and coach and workshop leader. She as the SFP became a nurse. Right. And she, you know, a lot of uh, SPs, 
they, in lower numbers, they have college educations, not because they're not smart, but because the educational system does not speak to them. Yeah. Yeah. But she went to nursing school and it was all so practical and applicable and it made sense and she could do something with it. She and she told I, I was saying some of her once about how extraordinary it is. Uh, she overcame the the uh, focus, you know, the differences in preferences to succeed in college the way she did. She said, oh, if I'm interested in it, I can focus and I do something very conceptual. And isn't it perfect? She did something that was as hands on as nursing and all that science she had to learn. She got to apply it. It was really clear to her. It was not theoretical mumbo jumbo. So she does have requirements that something be real, she would say. Now, what I do, she thinks, oh, that's interesting. Carol does that. But she wouldn't want to talk about that. That's not real to her in the way that what she had to learn in nursing school was real. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's both real and it's helping people. Yeah. So, yeah, both. Yeah. Exactly. Double win. <laughs> so, Rachel, are you able to talk? Yeah, I'm able to right. talk. Yeah. Could you tell us about your experience with TI? Sort of like what you think it is and then your experience with it. Is um, that like, well, yeah, going like, along with the rules, um, I mean, I was, <clears throat> sorry, there's a loud truck. I'm driving. Oh, <laughs> wow. The loudest truck. <laughs> um, I was the exact opposite of what I was going to do. I was going to be the exact time I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> like, I mean, uh, the, the, one of the ways you could, uh, a, a sort of a uh, an illustration of this. Could you talk about your interest in philosophy and then how you got into Kant as well? Because I, I see that as very oh. TI. Okay, well, I mean, I don't know. Um, I just am a thinking type of person. I'm stimulated by that. I don't know. See, I get kind of caught up where I'm like, I think if I am an ENFJ that maybe I have I would have a more developed TI by the sake of like, I was homeschooled when I grew up and I spent a lot of time watching PBS and like learning from shows like Bill Nye where they explain all these things, like here's how all these things work. And I just soaked all that information up like a sponge. Like if someone's explaining TI stuff to me, I seem to like really want that. I want those explanations, you know? Um, and I, I think that I'm good at it maybe because I was exposed to so much of it growing up because I read so much and watched so many educational shows. Um, so like I took a formal logic class in college and I actually was asked to rewrite the test <laughs> by my professor because I caught <laughs> errors that he made. But like, it doesn't seem like it's a huge interest of mine. Like I wouldn't spend my free time doing formal logic, but if you put the rules in front of me and the symbols and everything, I'm like, oh, okay, here you go. Like I can do it. Um, and I didn't really have, I didn't really have to study or try that hard. It seemed like it kind of comes natural to me, but I don't know if that's just because I was homeschooled and I had so much exposure to like how to think, like how to think critically and like, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I'm. Did I'm you? Not sure, I'm not did you? Sure I understand. Did you? Yeah. Did your parents do a good thing in not letting you watch? Oh yeah, you said you watched PBS, but did they did, did they limit the amount of television you watched? They didn't really. They just oh. limit like they just would limit like what kind of TV I could watch. Ah, right. they, didn't, they didn't want to see me watching like cartoons all the time, and they would have like blocks on certain channels sometimes. Um, oh. But I but I could watch all the like educational TV that I wanted. So I'd watch like Discovery Channel and like Animal Planet and the Learning Channel back when there was stuff that you could like learn about on that channel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> early on, it was it was good. <laughs> yeah, early yeah. on, and I was the, I was a kid when it was like still good, and so I loved it. I was learning. I was like learning so much all the time. Ben? Yeah, I was just reading a, a message here from Jonathan Campbell. Uh, he's asked a question. Uh, and just in case you can't see it, I'm just going to click on this. So, well, the audience will be able to see that. There you go. It is, isn't TI at its core more about developing rules and logic in your own mind? Yeah. How do the people in this hangout relate to that? Could any of them see themselves coming up with models or categories? And I think it's, for me, principles and rules are different. I think of rules as more STJ and I think principles is more TI. Yeah. So um, 
it seems to me that that may sound silly, but it seems there's a different. And here's a classic ENFP thing to say: the field of that to me is different. Yeah. Rules versus principles to me, because TI seems to me about say, it has to match up with these principles. Go ahead. Um, can I say something really quick about yep. the rules thing? I tend to make up reasons for like social rules concerning other people's feelings. So like. I would like for you to elaborate on the rules via the principles thing, because I'm not really sure. Might sound stupid, but I'm not really sure about what principles are, anyways. But like, I know that I, I make up like rules in my own head, like for social dynamics. You know what I mean? To get along with other people, they make sense, but it's for like the betterment of relationship. Right. Well, it seems to me that rules are practical and applicable, and they and you can they're like related to behaviors, and you can do this or not do that. It seems to me principles are very conceptual, like, uh, like huge, huge guiding. Uh, I'm not doing this very well, but it seems to me that TI paired with N, I get principles, and I get big over conceptual mm. principles to me seem like bigger and yeah. rules are more applicable and practical right. and apply to things we're doing. Is that helpful? Can I, that help I'm, help I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about F E and T E in the dominant position, both to me seem to make up rules, but one is where like, it's more about efficiency of an idea. And the other one is more about social, appropriateness and things like that i don't know no i does think, that I make think sense? I, it does i had a colleague who had, uh an apti board who had enfj preferences and i remember her once saying yes rules are good rules are good and i think leading with extroverted thinking or extroverted feeling and the rules she wanted were just like you're talking about they're rules for how we're going to do this with people but i think i think the lovely young woman in the car wants to say something now okay okay <laughs> Oh, well, I was going to throw out the example of uh, computer programming and, uh, like, uh, I used to build websites when I was 12, so I fully learned how to wow. use HTML. Um, and I know how to, once I get the rules and, like, I understand the code, I understand what's supposed to go where, and I know right. how to apply, like, those kinds of things. So I think the TI with N, with intuition, it isn't just, like, principles, it is a knowledge of how to apply like rules in like a coding kind of sense because there's a lot of you know stereotypically there's a lot of ti coders and programmers mm -hmm. out there I, I worked in a soft i agree with what you said i worked in a software company and there were both t uh introverted thinking and extroverted thinking there were both types there the end mm -hmm. the end especially the intps ended up in the really systems uh, systems planning kind of stuff, very high conceptual level stuff, whereas extroverted thinking was more widespread. People knock, you know, knocking out code tended to be many, more of them were extroverted thinking, whereas the introverted thinking, especially INTPs, ended up at the conceptual level like designing architecture stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really interesting because I've actually mm -hmm. suspected that I could actually have strong PE, but maybe I'm just not understanding because the what what I would do when I was young is I could easily like pull open a bunch of tabs about like here's the code, here's the HTML for how to do color, here's the HTML for how to do this, and I seemed to be able to pull up all the information I needed, and then I could take the information and combine it and and like turn it into the website. But I but I was good at figuring out how to get. The, like all the pieces I needed to build a fully functional website. You know, I was doing that when I was 12. So that tells me it's something to do with like my natural thought process if I'm yeah. able to do that. And you're also able to deal with those details too because I, I probably would never have gone there. I would have been doing something else because that would have gotten me so back bogged down in details. I wouldn't have wanted to hold all those details in my head. That's yeah, really cool like to me. Right. I'm not a huge fan of all the details either. <laughs> so I would, like, get a lot of templates and stuff that was kind of yeah. already done, and I would, like, plug in what I wanted into it because I didn't really want to have to get to any there details go. either. Yeah. Templates so are I good. I, I love good. templates. I love templates for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got uh, Jonathan's question uh, to answer. This is my idea that um, it's almost a related skill where – so you've got – so Carl Jung would say, and we'll look at that later, where the heart of uh, 
introverted thinking is the sort of a subjective premise and then you apply all of the logic and the structure to it uh, in order to sort of but now when but when uh, the person that does this it's not so much that they're applying introverted thinking as is that they're applying this skill that is associated with it that's part of it but not all of it and that can be used in the systems and the computing and things like that and when Rachel was talking about um, building a website because yes there's logic and stuff involved there but there's not the subjective aspect to it so for example you would say with Carl Jung when you look at uh, psychological types yes he's building uh, this on premises but you can also see also see wow there's a load of intellect and really nuanced thinking that goes on that when if he was presented with a problem say to do with systems that he would apply the logic of that but without the actual introverted thinking because you know it's not just one thing it's like different things and other skills associated with it so it's almost in two halves where you've got and i think socionics concentrates on the logic and structure part of ti rather than the than the fact that it's introverted and tends to go towards premises so i would say the purer form of ti would be the philosopher where you go from a subjective premise and then build that into a huge system or actually critique knowledge itself but you can also get as kersey talked about where you've got the intp that becomes the architect the architect of systems and Definitely. when kersey jr went into computing where well that's about the logic and structure not about the premise part of it the way which you would get with philosophy so it's like different aspects of it isn't it so it's just like with different aspects of fi or where these it's almost as if the Jungian functions are modalities and they have submodalities to them different aspects to them rather than saying a function is one particular thing uh have you got anything to say to that Shanina, from basically what Jung wrote about did he like in other works and then follows like break the function that's down into like different species of it and how they vary what you what you just said actually i agree with that there's like i call it different like sections of the functions people want to sum it up as one thing but there's like different like compartments of each function so i agree with everything you said i didn't hear anything um that young opposed to or anything like that I'm impressed yeah. <laughs> with your novel. <laughs> well, thank you, because he also wrote that, yes, there's a bit, I'm going to show it on screen, uh, a little bit out of order. Ben, uh, after you that, can I add something about computer programmers? and? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Uh, I just wanted a, a little bit about, uh, did I actually, oh, I hope I had it. Oh, here it is. Right, so this is about where he's talking about the I little J's, or in other words, the TI and FI DOMs. So he says here, the laws of logic are not necessarily deflected since the one-sidedness lies in the premise the premise is the predominance of the subjective factor and so you can tend to get a lot of ideas where they pluck an idea out of the air but then make it wonderfully logical and self-consistent and you can say that bb did that a bit with the model b but like let's get it in our structure and stuff and make it consistent now if i want to be chick i will um i'll just uh Critify the language a bit by saying that inside the ENTP's head, it says credible BS. <laughs> so where they could take a premise and make yeah. it logically consistent, but the but the premise can be wrong. So that's the thing. It's um, and I'll bring well, you. Well, e e ENTP is very good at devil's advocate. Yes, that's yeah. the thing. I really enjoy that arguing <laughs> both sides of it. I love that. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes they don't even turn that. And the pro I have no problems with that. The problem I have with it, though, is when they pretend to actually hold those views. <laughs> yeah. So we see something on camera. Olympia, green lady. That cannabis. Oh, there you go. Uh, libertarian. Oh. That's what's fascinating <laughs> about Rachel. You, she She's a libertarian, but it's almost like for NF reasons and like community and things like that. So I find that fascinating that was one of the ways to differentiate between what is the best fit for uh rachel entj or enfj so it's like in, in development is a big thing and I, I like when i get when i get in a particularly intp mood i don't call them types i call them individuation patterns 
because I sort of put a little bit of it, that it's dynamic and that there's a developmental aspect to type. And I sort of picked that up a bit from uh, Dario. Uh, I picked it up from Baron. She's very much into, you know, the core self is like this and what we're given the developed self is like this. It has a whole lot to do with development, individuation. Right. So, um, and, then, and, then, uh, and then also, it's a lot more dynamic, Jung, because uh, he wrote about functions being differentiated. And he said, I think he said something about the lead function. It's either that function that we are most gifted by nature or the one that will give the person most success in life. So he's leaving the door open there that somebody could have, could have been born with a certain predisposition, but they decided to become, say, so maybe you could have, say, ESFJ and they grow up in a real TJ household. So theoretically, maybe they could develop a TE attitude but i would think really what they develop is they just end up being good at te <laughs> they yeah. still have the that's what i think motivations associated with fe i think certain types are more likely to go to their role function than others so what i what i mean by that is i think enfj and esfj are more likely to do the te thing than fi doms are to do the ti thing in that if there's a clash between FI and TI, the FI, the FI DOM doesn't really want to go against the FI because it's so much a part of them. Whereas the FE DOM might think like this, well, I don't really like it, but everybody else wants to do it. And for everybody else, I'm going to get into business mode. For, yeah. Because that's the group, the group atmosphere. Like if they're in a project at work and they want to get stuff done and they're not really... That's true. <laughs> and and you know Ben, I, what I've I've realized a, a, a friend of mine has a husband who's the director, and he lead, INFP leads with introverted feeling, and he does not have the warm fuzzy people thing going on. He has these very explicit ideas about how and values about how this thing can be done, and so sometimes the person with FI has the warm fuzzy people thing going on because how you, for example, me as a Southern woman, e ENFP, it's a real important to me, how you treat people. So I don't get to my FE thing through FE. I get to it through my values. Yeah. yeah. I have values about how you treat people a certain way. So I think some people would think they're getting FE from me, but what they're mm -hmm. really getting is I value that. So my, my friend whose husband was INFP, a director, he did not have the FE thing going on. It was all about his values. So she, it, she said she, when we, we learned the eight function, she really got the difference between FI and FE. And I um, think where they cross is when you have someone with FI preference who the way you treat people is part of their values. That makes sense? So as uh, Shalina said there, there's different sections to a function. So as you said there, Carol, uh, and I'm showing it on, so, so the audience sure. can see this. You say there you got to the manners part, not because of uh, the FE preference, but because right. of the upbringing. However, theoretically, you would still would have had that good ability to read emotions. Well, only, I, I only know part. that. Yeah, but I think I, 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 as a Dario, feeling extrovert, Dario says that ENFPs have more neuron mirror neuron activity than any of the sixteen types. So even that, I think I get to it through brain function of I, of ENFP rather than FE. He, and, and I don't, and he, it's not that he ever explained it, but he said, for some reason, you combine extroverted intuition, introverted feeling, and you get more mirror neurons. And that's how I feel into it rather than, I, I don't think I'm using FE. I think I'm using the brain thing he's talking about. Can I also say one thing? One, one, one important sure. thing. Um, Vanderhoop talks about how our upbringing also has a lot to do with like sometimes it's not yeah. a function like she's saying it's your upbringing if you were raised in a family or you were raised in the south like she said where manners are a big thing being a southern yeah. gentleman and a southern like a lady i'm a southern belle they call you guys <laughs> that's just your family values you know what i mean it's not necessarily a function he talks he goes he gets into so yeah. much stuff like so much goes into type um, but yeah, I just wanted to add that I agree with her. I, I don't think it's her FE. It's just her upbringing and where she grew up and stuff, her Southern values and things. Mm -hmm.
Thank so, you. Well said. Exactly. So what I would say about the ability of ENFP to read emotions. So we've got the FE there that's going to be strong because they're a feeling extrovert. So, you know, they're going to be good at in uh, uh, feelings outside of themselves. But also there's the aspect of NE and the pattern recognition. Oh, of sure. Someone's done a certain thing. They're upset about something. Uh, they have a certain thing they recognize. It. So they might, they, they might learn well to calibrate people from the pattern recognition of or they're showing that facial expression and they did that in that situation before and they can sure. read the context of and how people react and with the emotions in that context so that's the ne part and then you've got the nf part of being interested in people's psychology anyway so all of that might come together to in enfp is being particularly good at reading people but because you've got the help from the ne pattern recognition and the nf abstract psychological thing going on there whereas Listen. esfp has not got so much that going on but they are aware of the emotions around them and jeff says to be honest that well we want the attention <laughs> and so we play to the audience uh, uh jonathan asked me quite cheekily uh okay ben <laughs> How about you tell everyone how you, in capitals, think you use TI minus, especially when younger, and see how they relate to it. Okay. So, looking at things from different angles, uh, I think I would have loved to have done uh, philosophy. Uh, and then I found out there was this subject that, and I was like, oh, I wanted to do that. But when I was younger, I was also very, like, FI was very strong in me. And uh, I, was, I was like very left wing when I was younger, but it was like based on principles of it. And these things can be very bound up together. I mean, I've become like very libertarian now in like Austrian school. And I listen to Peter Schiff, but it was sort of bound up together. But there was this thing of looking at things. It was weird because I was watching Open University before I could read because the books were so boring so i so i didn't learn to read until i was about eight because the books were so boring and then i sort of went forward a lot and then they had these books out called bangers and mash which was so entertaining about two naughty chimpanzees but at the same time i was watching like open university with the science stuff on there so um i was i was interested in science i would watch the uh royal institution christmas lectures things and they're on youtube now uh, and these were these science lectures for children but they're actually at quite a high level um so it's hard to divorce the ti thing from nt stuff uh actually then i can say something about that yeah i'll just say uh, one thing and then, oh, I'd, sure, I'd, then I'd, my dad was um in mensa he had the card and he would give me these sort of like Mensa problems when I was like, uh, what age, like 11, 12, 13. And it's like, I didn't know how to solve the problems, but I gained to understand the solutions. And so that's one of these things where people don't actually get a higher IQ because once they understand the solution and they can recognize a question is of a kind, then you know, oh, this is this type of question, and I know how to solve that type of question. So people can improve their IQ by going through through practice. Now, what's probably going to happen is their intelligence will get higher, but not as much as what their IQ gets higher by, because they're practicing classes of questions. Like, here's another one about probability. Here's another one about sequence. So. I would do those types of things, but I also had like ADHD things going on. So my TI was uh, that kind of thing. And then when I got into typology, it's like, well, I want to look at it from this angle and that angle and that angle. And it's like different angles on the truth. So uh, if Socionic says something and it agrees with Kersey, I'm like, oh, great, that's good. It lines up. So, like, so, for instance, it's the way Dario defines extroverted center. It really lines up with the artisan temperament. That's right. 
Summed, but I disagree with his definition of SI because they just put all the SI, all the Guardian stuff in one functional bucket. Whereas I actually think that it's SI with TE slash FE and NE because when, when, when uh, SI is in the break position, such as for somebody like uh, Rachel, it doesn't mean that she's bad at following rules and following standard operating procedure. It's more the case of the socionics thing where ENFJs and ENTJs, well, they work themselves to death and they're not in touch with their bodies and they have stress-related illnesses. So I think that's SI, but in Guardians, I think you've got this thing where they want a comfortable pace. They don't want to push themselves. So I have a slow, comfortable pace combined with TE slash FE. So you've got comfortable pace uh, STJs that don't like a challenge and want to do the same thing all the while with the TE. And then I think the way that NE works in them, they want to follow a generalization and generalization goes across many situations. This is the standard operating procedure. When the people who are any max, so any ego, so NPs, they like to see the connections, make the generalizations. So just like INFJ doesn't come up with their own theories, but they love the theories of other people, I think that SJs like the connections and generalizations, but they don't come up with their own generalizations and connections the way that an MP does. And because they keep coming up with new ones, they don't stick to one. So that's how I think it works with Guardian. I don't think all the Guardian stuff is put in the SI bucket. Right then, so that's some TI for me. And now we can get to the slides. Any questions, though, before we get to the slides? Yeah, I have a comment. Go on. About INFJ and theory. Yeah, go on. Um, and I actually, it's like, since it's like revelation, their theoretical, quote unquote, mind, it's not like a mind, but it's like comes in the form of a revelation to them. But it's still like a theory because you can't prove it. It's like the revelation or whatever. I don't know. When you said that INFJs don't come up with their own theories, I don't know if I agree. I don't know because of the revelation part of the NI, the sort of like yeah, yeah. downloading. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they could, so for instance, dream about it, have a revelation where it like pops through from the other kind and they get that flash of insight. So yeah, I, I agree with that. So it's like a different method. Uh, I have I have something to add that that Dick Thompson taught me, Ben. When I was in one of uh, I was in the class learning eight functions from uh, Dr. Dick Thompson, and I, oh, there came a time where we were, you know to practice each of the ones, and I opened my mouth and pure extroverted thinking flowed out, and I said to my partner, "I think I did it," and she said, "I think you did it too." And so I asked him, I said, wait a minute, I have ENFP preferences. How did I open my mouth in pure extroverted thinking? And he showed me, you know, introverted feeling is my secondary. And that's very vulnerable. Introverted feeling, I, well, my hypothesis is it's even more vulnerable than extroverted feeling. They're both very vulnerable. Yeah. But introverted feeling is extraordinarily vulnerable. And he pointed to it, you know, FI. And he said, extroverted thinking is my tertiary he said it was way too painful to stay here sometimes and it wasn't safe he said a safe place to go is extroverted thinking can't be heard at extroverted thinking so you could have developed extroverted thinking as a place to get away from the vulnerability and i was brought up in an extroverted thinking household with a very young istj preferences mother so extroverted thinking is all she spoke to me because she was 19 when she had me so I think I learned it at home. So t going back to the, the develop self piece and Dick Thompson to told me you go there in order to be more safe and it's less vulnerable. And I'm thinking of my INFJ friend connecting to this conversation. She's got FE in the secondary and TI in the tertiary. She majored. She actually went to graduate school in philosophy. And there were many times at the software company where I'd be dealing with an INFJ who sounded so introverted thinking and so analytical. 
and I'm thinking that in an analytical environment you're gonna go to the place that's safer to be which is to your analytical language rather than stay in your feeling language I, I got the the analytical feeling from so God that's such an ENFP thing to say I got the analytical vibe from so many INFJs in that IT environment there's a, a thing in socionics called um, beneficiary shift where oh. the benefit the it, it's on on the, it's various levels like um, uh, the pips levels um, uh, physiological informational psychological and social but overall INTP is the benef beneficiary and INFJ is the benefactor uh, but INFJ can act INTP ish for a mm -hmm. short time yeah. Yeah. I think it's because the libido is low for that subject as in psychic energy so it's like so if we, so INTPs will interact with INTP resemblers will interact with INFJs and they'll be excited but that's like the INFJs they get a little bit moody and they're not interested in it as much as the INTPs are uh, so I call it the uh, the TI the TI eyes are bigger than its belly <laughs> for the, for the INFJ um, well, they have to go. They would have to go back to their catalyst home. I think they'll go yeah, out and do the yes. inverted thinking thing. But then they got to go back to their NF home, which is their yeah. their temperament home. And also, oh. beneficiary shift of ENFP. I think what well, Rachel wants to say yes. something. Oh, yes. I was going to say Rachel. I do have something to say there, like with the Kant's uh, critique of pure reason class, yeah, which was very TI heavy seminar. I was also the only female in there. Yeah. which made it a little extra intimidating. Um, not that I usually care about that sort of thing, because I've always kind of been one of the guys. But, um, yeah, I, I I still had the highest grade in the class, but the whole time I, I think that, like, I'm, like, I have these, like, NF tendencies where it's, like, but why are we just sitting around a table just, like, going over this, like, 300-year-old, I don't know how old it actually is, something like that, <laughs> like, you know, we're going over this and over this. Like, how many times do we need to just, like, talk about these, like, just abstract concepts? Like, how are we going to help people? Or, like, what are we going to yeah. do that's going to actually, like, do something? Like, I'm always kind of thinking about that or I'd start asking those kinds of questions. But, like, I could do the TI. You yeah. know, I could write the papers. I can construct the logical arguments. And, like, I can do all that. But it's, like, you know, and I don't know. I'm, like, I'm still just questioning, like, as a would I be more likely to be an ENFJ or an INFJ if I seem to be able to use the TI? Just well, I, 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 well, you see, the thing is, um, uh, what have we got, NI? So I think ENFJ, it's one of these things of, of energy. I have higher energy. You can see right, that, so like, it's, especially it's, when I'm talking. <laughs> right, so it's situational in that, so, like I said, overall NF, but situ in certain situations, you're going to do the TI thing. It's just, it's that self-affirmation block shift. It's like with INTP as me now being more expressive in Hangouts because I'm on my territory. And yeah. when and you I've get into certain, it. it's a situational use of TI. Yeah. And, and that, that block is when you actually shift to theoretically to more INTJ. Uh, now, I know it's not TI there, but it's the social mission block of INTJ is NITI. The theory yeah. being that they're a thinking introvert and an intuitive introvert. Well, I'm even wondering if the reason I did excel in psychology and in formal logic was maybe not even necessarily using TI. I mean, maybe I was able to figure it out using other functions. Yeah. Maybe your catalyst NF core is what is what did that. I mean, a whole a whole bunch of therapists are are in are NF catalyst, and we're like a tiny part of the pop uh, like. 10 to 12 percent of the population but something like 35 percent of the therapists were intuitive feelers so i yeah. think there's that speaking to our core rachel yeah I'll, I'll i'll just uh i'll just show something that jonathan uh said in the <laughs> chat because it's quite funny and then i'll let shalina get in because i think she's got some you gotta to hold it up ben because people's faces are in front of it for me thank you all right okay so <laughs> We'll take good questions. Well, this chat is filled with good questions because I'm the only one in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. So just in case, so uh, any, have you got anything to say, Shalina, on uh, what Carol said or what we've said? 
so far since I do the, the only thing about the ENFJ that I just read the other day um, from Vanderhoek's book that I'm continuing to read I'm not done with it but the ENFJ likes to teach people and stuff in regards to like what if the logic or whatever is aimed at society to make people better get along with each other we will teach manners we will teach how to talk to each other we will teach how to better understand each other so like as far as the logic and stuff goes because Kersey calls them the teachers right yeah yeah like he does. right we we do utilize logic um vander hoop and young actually both <laughs> said this the fe dominant thinks a great deal but it's always in tandem with the extroverted feeling it's never for reason for it like itself it's just it's like to help people better get along like the world or whatever domain you're in because the enfj tends to also lean towards more philosophical problems like more spiritual problems and yeah. things like that because of the ni so it's oh, like and enfj's the other thing is that they make great psychologists because they're good with people they can read people's strengths and weaknesses and then the NI is like you gen you pick up on a general, like insightful thing about the person that you're talking to. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, here. I'm, 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 think Oprah. Think Oprah. Look at all the the people exactly. Oprah interviews, all the spiritual stuff, and make the world a better place stuff. Oprah is just classic. And ENFJ, that in charge uh, interaction style. You know, Oprah built an empire. Yeah. Uh, and and her core, she's always coming from that catalyst core of make the world a better. I, I just listened this afternoon to a recording of her interviewing Brene Brown. And it, it, it was just fabulous. And I'm, you know, that's just classic. She's just such an incredible example, this classic catalyst, I think. Just one more thing. One more thing, really, really yeah. quick. With the ENFJ, when they're listening to you, they could listen to you for a while. And then the, their and I will allow them to be like, this is your problem. This is your problem right here. So they're able to help people to fix themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? That could be a little bit like INTJ, where it's like, you know, like this is your problem. This is how you solve it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do that. But they're a little That's bit more mean about it. My feelerness, because I can get very problem solvey with people. And I'm like, am I a feeler? Am I being empathetic when I do that? But I'm like, you are. You it's like do. a proactive <laughs> FE thing. FE dominance do that as well. And then sometimes yeah. we can get impatient when the person doesn't listen to our advice. Um, you know what I, I mean? I think, I mean, I think, I think Jung opened the door by saying that because the lead function is differentiated by experience, well, how about the other functions being differentiated by experience? I mean, Dario's whole premise of eight keys to self-leadership is that you can get better at the skills associated with the functions, if not the yeah. functions themselves. You can, you can, because Vanderhoop said that too. He talks about the dual type whose ops function is differentiated like the dominant. So then you get rare types like that too, which I think I am an ENFJ who has a great deal of NI, where at first I thought I was an INFJ, but it's like, I just have really, really, really strong NI. Yeah, and and you, and you also had some strong extroverted sensing as well, and you related yes. to that. Yeah. Well, that's the, create. remember for ENFJ, that's the creativity function. I've many ENFJs I've known, they've all got that sensor, that sensory concrete thing going. In addition to their conceptual, they, they're doing something hobby wise or something, yeah. or they plan these exercises that are very sensing. And I'm in awe of that because I don't have an ounce of that. So I'm She's in right. awe of what ENFJs have there. So I'm sensing this is going to be a multi-parter. <laughs> <laughs> because we've not started yet but i think we've started in a way where we've given personal examples of the function news to sort of lead people in and i like this is from dario's book and it's a little bit naughty of me to show this scan in this book without his permission but it, it's so you folks look at this just this scan by the book there Actually, that's what I tell him all the time: is that you and I do that. <laughs> you and I both do that, and we're really selling his book. So I don't think it, he bothers him. <laughs> so what he writes here is actually right. Uh, in, so his view of Jung is pretty much what I've picked up myself, and and uh, we can get Shalina's view on this. So I'll just read this out for people who are on a mobile device. Uh, Jung noticed that people grow psychologically, a process he called individuation. And as people mature, they come to prefer one function, sensing, intuiting, thinking, or feeling. This function becomes dominant in either an introverted or extroverted attitude. Thus, he identified eight categories or types. Now, actually, what I've read, Jung saw vertness as genetic. 
uh, the other the functions were about development and individuation and differentiation but he saw vertness as genetic he sort of wrote it as a large biological uh, biological determinants because he wrote about um siblings you're talking about, inter you're talking about introverted or extroverted is that what yeah yeah vertness is a fantastic mm -hmm. word instead of saying introvert, <laughs> introvert mm -hmm. just say vertness and i once I once forgot that that word. I think, oh, what is that great word? And then I heard it again. Yes, that is fantastic. That word, vertness. <laughs> so vertness is determined due to someone's nature. And I think Dario has shown that in studies where this you can pretty much tell an introvert extrovert from the brain activity. Yeah. Uh, that it's much more towards the back in the introvert. Uh, so and Ben, he's he's got this great great. Uh, uh, Thing he does with his, you know, the the head, the headpiece on doing the. Uh, yeah, the I'm EG blanking. Cap. And in the fact, EG cap, the EG cap, and he said you put a class, uh, somebody with classic introverted preferences in front of the screen. You say I'm about to show you an image, and their brain is just going nuts doing stuff, and then they show the image, and barely anything's happened because they were so active. You put a classic extrovert in front of it. You say I'm about to show you an image, and their brain goes quiet because they're waiting on the image. The introvert's brain never goes quiet waiting on the image. The extrovert goes, okay, I'm, I'm waiting on an image to come. And and he showed how our brain is quiet and then goes whoosh when you show us an image. Yeah. And the introvert's brain was doing this the whole time. <laughs> there's, a, there's a little bit of a difference between modern day Jungian-based typology and then the original work, in my opinion, is that I've been looking at his sections on abstraction. And the way he defines abstraction he sees it as something which is uh, a large component of introversion. And the way he defines abstraction, he sees it as related to TI. These days, if we look at the questions for intuition, for the intuition versus sensing scale, the questions are in there are about abstraction. So... Yeah. That's how Can I was it? taught it. That's how yeah. I was taught it, Ben, is that abstraction's about introversion, not about, you know, TI. Yeah, whereas, uh, yeah, you were taught, but but some, but, but Kersey would teach that abstraction is about um, someone who's in their head and therefore intuitive rather than sensor. I think one of the problems that Jung may have come across is that because he was describing himself INTPs find it very difficult to disentangle TI from NI because it's one of these powerful functions that's in the background but it's interlocked so much with TI that we can see when we're doing the NE but we can't see to see when we're doing the NI because and you, the way Jung writes about it is this thing which sort of guides the feeling he talks about the, the primordial image that they try to bring into consciousness with the laws of reason it's tricky. So the way he defined, so so the way he defines TI, it looks like TI with, it looks like the abstract kind of TI. The way he defines TI is like TI in INTP, not so much what it's like in ISTP. So and Barons would say that's the that's the temptation th that you would you would slide like my father had ISTP. He was an improviser, artisan improviser computer person and I could and my stepfather was INTJ and I could see how very different they were yeah. the INTJ chart the course button up engineer type whereas my improviser father was uh, he was t led with TI he loved to solve them problems all day but right. very but that SE came out in that he was very hands-on and pragmatic about it he wasn't building abstract systems with it <clears throat> he was solving solving problems and doing logic with it but they were so different i but i can see how he was doing ti but what we classically talk about ti as looks much more like the intp than the istp yeah and also when i was thinking about the way jung conceived of say enfj well we would not the way he described abstraction he puts that with introverted thinking but we tend to put it with intuition because are we really measuring intuition? A lot of times in tests, we're measuring abstraction. So when the ENFJ is abstract and they've got inferior TI, then it sort of bumps it up a level because they're overall abstract. So they're interested in ideas and things. 
because all intuitives are interested in ideas to a certain extent. Yeah. Which is why the why the TI break mm -hmm. looks different in ENFP compared to ESFP, because ENFP is sense. abstract type. But the thing, Ben, one thing, there's a passage where Young actually talked about the difference between introverted sensing and extroverted sensing. He called introverted sensing abstract sensing. Yes. So, they, so he calls all the introverted all the oh. introverted functions yes, abstracts. Yeah, I went That's that helpful. Link. Thank you, Rachel. That's helpful. So, so he gave the example, I think, where That's if you true. abstract from a feeling, you can get ethics. And the yeah. ethics is the ab abstracted feeling. And he, right. he talked about aesthetics being abstracted mm -hmm. sensor. Yeah. Uh, he didn't mention the other one. I don't think he mentioned abstracted intuition. Uh, he might he have. Did. Sure. He did, but I'd have to like... <laughs> Yeah, because I just, I just looked at that. I just I wish each of those was a chapter on itself because they're so dense. They're he calls any concrete intuition, and so does Vanderhoof. They call yes. it concrete intuition. Yes. Because Which is it, interesting because we're so abstract. Yeah, but, but, but it's, like, it's the thing that's outside of you, and you have associations with it. Yeah. And generally when we see that this thing is like this thing, what it's like people can see it and test it and say, well, it's not like that because these are the differences. Whereas if you do it in your head, it's like, well, how do you argue with that? But I think that concrete, what they meant, I could be wrong, it's my comprehension, but I think that they, what they mean by concrete is that it's re real world stuff. Like any, yeah. it's not about spiritual stuff. It's about like manifesting things in the real world. It just hasn't manifested yet. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think by yeah. concrete, they mean it's just in the real world. It could be manifested or it could be observed in the real world. Yeah. You know I'm what sure. I mean? And also it goes towards, especially in any DOMS, possibilities in the real world yeah uh, so they're concrete intuition yeah. you guys are apt because intuition is just apt when we say abstract we mean it's just like not it's complicated so any can be complicated in the sense where it's not manifested yet but it's concrete yeah. because it's real world based right. you know what but I mean? yes, yeah, objective yeah it's in our it's in the future though it's not here yet it's real right. to us, yeah but it's not it's not con like a sensor would go, oh, my God, like, like Martin Luther King, ENFJ. Mm -hmm. He was yeah. not describing anything real in the world right. in the 1960s. But he was painting this beautiful picture of this vision of how it could be in the real world, though it wasn't anywhere near like that in the real world. I'm yeah. not certain about his type. <laughs> really? I, I personally think it could have been an ENFP with a developed FI. That's just my opinion. Martin oh, Luther King. That's interesting. I'll have to go look at that because I've just always accepted it on faith by whoever told me. Yeah, yeah but it's FJ like the, visions, the vision in I vision is more like a revelation than a goal like e, like mm. NE. You know what I mean? Like the any vision in the dominant position is more like I I see this happening. I see that happen. I'm going to make it happen. Whereas NI is more like it, it's going to happen whether we like it or not. It's like a mm. revelation. You well, know? I can see that when this is where other things come in that sort of compromise functions. So for example, if you're an EJ type mm -hmm. and you've got NI, well, the EJs like to plan ahead. So I also have the NE. I'm like, yeah. I can see both of those going yeah. on where I have the NI. Oh, this is what's, I, I see all of humanity going this one direction with like what? climate change. Exactly. That's stuff. what I mean though. But you see them I going that to... direction, but it's like, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, I mean, no, it's, it, yeah, cool. I think we're on the same we're on yeah. the same train of thought. You, I agree with you. Like I could say, society in the next two years is going to be here because I talk a lot about the eras. But it's like for me, yeah. and he is more like Martin Luther King said, "I have a dream one day that racism will end, that we'll be able to uh, play together." But that's more like a any thing, like a any fi racism's not good or whatever. I I want this to happen. I'm going to do things to make this happen. Versus I see this happening inevitably, which is more uh, like ni. It's, I don't know. There's a little bit of a role thing going on there, isn't there, Carol? Because you've got the teacher and then you've got the champion. And his role in society was a little bit of a champion of change as well and as it, being the teacher. It was, I, actually, this is thank you, thank you for saying all this because I'm seeing both. He was teacher and champion. It's like he was called on to be both. And, and I hear exact, thank you. I hear exactly what you're saying about. I see this could happen, but I'm wondering if he if he was coming from introverted intuition, it was like the world is tending toward justice. It just history has a long arc, but it has yeah. to get there. It has to become this. And I don't know which it is. 
how I experience, because remember, I'm an NE Dom. Right. So introverted intuition is my fifth. So I have no control over it. It just mm -hmm. comes up or it doesn't. So I can't not do any extrovert intuition. I, I don't right. know how to not do it. It just burst out <laughs> of me. But I value when introverted intuition comes up, but I had to learn to trust it because I n so naturally go to the extroverted. Introverted intuition comes up and is so almost ethereal or cloud-like or did mm -hmm. I really hear that or did that? It's, it's because mine is in the dominant versus the fifth. Right. I get that introverted intuition and that's my, I think that's where my spiritual comes from as much as from introverted yes. feeling. I think it comes from introverted intuition, right. but I had to learn to trust it because it's so far away from anything mm -hmm. I can control. Yes. I had, to, but you, if you have ENFJ, ENFJ preferences, it's your uh, auxiliary. So you would, it will happen faster for you and right. you will go there and trust it. Whereas I had to learn how to listen to it and trust it. Yeah. Like I'm so, guided by that anyway. Right. So Rachel made a good point about, so, ENFJ is an intuitive extrovert. Mm -hmm. So they are directed, they are objective, they, they are externally based and they're an intuitive. So it makes sense just based on that, that they're going to be good at extroverted intuition, even if they don't value it. So model G would see it as NE is in the service mm -hmm. of FE, whereas yeah. NI is valued. And sometimes, mm -hmm. so it, it's strong both ways. So for example, when Jung actually described the types with the auxiliary function, mm -hmm. he sat on the fence about the vertness of the auxiliary function. So, for example, he put well-known examples such as practical intellect with sensation. He didn't say introverted sense. And then he said philosophical intuition with the aid of a great intellect. He never said philosophical intuition with practical thinking. So he defined the first function very specifically but he did not specify the vertness of the second one. And I think that's because through experience, he would have seen. So, for example, ESTJ can be pretty good at being forceful and in the moment, uh, not just the introverted sensor thing. Or maybe he would have seen that uh, with... Uh, he would have seen it in himself. Well, I'm seeming to be pretty good at NI here. <laughs> and not just... Go on. Sorry, but I think it's a comprehension issue with me. Can you clarify and tell me if I'm wrong or not, like break right down? But when he says practical intellect with sensing, I thought he was talking about TE because all yes, of yes. the extroverted. So it's like yeah, TA, ESTJ because in another yes. lecture, he, he actually lays the map out that the ox function has to be the opposite attitude. Ah, he, right. So in, in that it's one, a missing lecture. You guys haven't read it yet, I guess, because yeah, I but, think if you would have, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like one of these things. But yeah, I mean, you said that practical. I'm thinking, yeah, that's ESTJ. But you see, that's one of these things where it's like the introverted logic says that the second function has to be <laughs> SI. Whereas... Yeah, but he, he said that in a lecture. He literally yeah. said that in, a, in another lecture outside of psychological types. So it's it's like a lot of missing pieces from psychological types. Right. And Vander who also made it clear that Jung was in a very dark place during when he wrote that. And then he developed other, like he further expanded on what he meant in psychological types and further lectures down the line. So there's a lot of stuff that I've read that like, if you just read psychological types, you're like missing other information that Jung went on about yeah. with the functions. Okay, Carol, you're, you're, could, could you plug yourself in? <laughs> I have to go elsewhere to get it. I need to leave. I'm dying here, and I didn't just want to disappear. Okay. Guys, I have loved every minute of this, and I hope to see you all again here again. Ben, thank you for inviting okay. me. Okay, nice Emerald, to meet Emerald. you, Carol. Uh, nice Emerald. to meet you. <laughs> I loved um, it. So I'm wondering uh, what Jung wrote about what we would call the creative function in socionics. I think Dario called it the transformative function. Uh, the transcendent function. Uh, so, for example, Jung may have written about NI in his type, the uh, uh, the uh, speculative thinking with um, uh, intuition, and he would have said T I N E. But then, did he write about the other side of the auxiliary function? Carl Jung said that 
hold on. I'm sorry. I have to gather my thoughts. That's okay. It's complex stuff. Carl, you're like, all I know is he said that the other four functions order themselves in the exact same way as the top four, like, I don't know if it's ego or uh, consciousness. I don't know what it's called or whatever, but the top, tw the top four functions in MBTI, basically Carl Jung said that the other four order themselves in the exact same way. So like an INTP, TE would be their fifth function. You know what I mean? He, he, he yeah. called the tertiary function, the second auxiliary. And he said it was unconscious and it was a, an auxiliary to the inferior. That's what he said. Yeah. That the see, tertiary that, was yeah. auxiliary to the inferior. Yeah, yeah that's I, one of these, I, would, I would have said to Carl Jung, you know, that's a nice little model there, but check out Model G. It's a little bit yeah. there. He says, yes, you're right. You're absolutely right, Victor Galenko, because, you know, I'm wicked strong at NI. He wouldn't have used that kind of phrasing, though. He wouldn't have said wicked strong. Now, <laughs> I, he would have recognized that. I personally have a theory where introverts, to me, are a little bit more stronger in introverted functions well, because how about this? of the attitude. Well, I mean, here's, here's a Galenko thing. Galenko would say it like this. Well, why not put all the functions of the same vertness together? That's more uh -huh. in line with your teachings, isn't it, Carl? Yeah. Because you're very much about vertness being the most important <laughs> thing in your system. And Dario has said from his research, mm -hmm. he said at the back of this book, and I'll, hopefully I'll get there quick. He said that, I think it was some, here we go. Uh, oh, we'll put it on screen. I will uh, just hold it to camera, and okay. uh, it should focus. Come on, you little darling, focus. <clears throat> it's not focusing. You can I'll just read, read it out. It. I'll read it out. <laughs> People with an introverted dominant process do more introverted activities overall, particularly basic ones. For example, someone, I'm just going to put a bit of white card there, and then it will focus on the white card, and then I'll, th then it'll be clear there. There we go. Uh, for example, someone who most prefers introverted feeling will likely report moderate, moderate, <laughs> report moderate comfort with basic introverted intuiting, such as having sudden aha insights they can trust, and moderate comfort with basic introverted sensing, such as reviewing lots of information over time to confirm a set standard. Conversely, people with an extroverted dominant process tend to do more basic extroverted activities overall. So the idea that all the functions of your dominant attitude because it makes sense that if you're if you're subjective, mm -hmm. then you're going to be okay at all of the all of the subjective functions. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It makes yeah. sense to me. So you but know what what I've noticed though is things yeah. that make sense to my head. I would read information from Carl Jung or his associates and find out I was wrong, even if it made sense. I was still wrong. Well, no, 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 but, but, but were you wrong though? Because it's all subjective. <laughs> well, I mean, as far as the way I understood, I comprehended yeah, the function. Yeah. So now we can actually move on to the theory. So this is actually interesting. So Dario is right about this. And we can get your comments on it, uh, Shalina. So uh, I think this is a good paragraph. Why do we have a type? This is the kind of thing that the INTPs think about. Why do we have a type? Why are we defining it? I, and, and me, I, I call it a resemblance or an individualization pattern. And Dario's mm -hmm. probably got it from Linda. They call it a type pattern. And even now they want to call it a personality pattern. Uh, and as and as as Carol said there, ENFP preferences, and she got that from Linda. She doesn't mm -hmm. want, want to put somebody in a box. She wants to say, no, no, you have ENFP preferences. You are not yeah. an ENFP, <laughs> um, because they want to make type more fluid and more about development, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So why do we have a type? Jung believed our type results from how we balance three major factors: human instincts, societal demands, and our individual strengths. Our type is how we handle universal human instincts, hunger, sex, curiosity, love, ambition, etc., against specific social and cultural demands, going to school, joining the army, getting married, etc., in a way that best suits our natural strengths, having athletic, mathematical, or musical talent, for example. And then I've put a bit there about Kersey with he came up with four different types of intelligence. And it was part of his PhD thesis on intelligence, where he wanted to have a practical version of intelligence related to various social roles. So he had a logistical intelligence of monitors. So these are the STJ, is good at monitoring and procedures and implementation and administration and of providers that's to do with caring and providing for the family and protecting more SFJ kind of stuff. 
as in the SFJs are predisposed to that, but they can also do other stuff. And then you've got the strategic intelligence of the systems of the NTPs and the coordination towards long-term goals of the NTJs. And then you've got the diplomatic intelligence where you have the directive roles, which is about guiding people. And then you've got the mediating roles, which is like offering people options for change because they've got, because they've got the FI thing of like rapport being on the same level and anything of options, not having a fixed goal to push people towards. Uh, and then there's a, another intelligence. Yes, the artisan intelligence. SFP is more towards improvising. SDP is more towards expediting. Think, thinking really quickly under pressure. And uh, getting things done before your opponent has time to think. Those kind of uh, socially intelligent roles that Kersey would come up with. Almost the equivalent of the functions. Kersey's four intellects. Rachel, did I sense that you wish to speak, or did I just imagine it? <laughs> oh, I no, I'm just I'm just taking it all in. I'm all right, right now. <laughs> okay, so I oh, hope. Oh, here we go. This one's for you, Shalina. Students of Jung have read deeper, resulting in more specific interpretations how we mature in our use of functions. Specifically, it appears Jung proposed that a differentiated function is active, whereas an undifferentiated function is passive. For example, differentiated, differentiated extroverted thinking involves structuring and managing one's environment according to logical criteria, measurable evidence and so on. In contrast, undifferentiated use might mean following a structure without adjusting it to the current situation or maybe picking a more effective structure to follow. This results in orderly but foolish behaviour. So what I've put there is the ENTJ is more likely to adapt to the current situation. And I think the ESTJ is more likely to go to a different expert, <laughs> a different method that they've uh, learnt. So uh, what do you think of that there, Shalina? Hold on. Why would you think that the ESTJ would go to a different one and the ENTJ would like... Can you repeat that? Well, so it's, I'm sure it's, I yeah, it's a temperament thing where ENTJ is an NT and Kersey sees NTs as utilitarian. And so they're more likely to think for themselves, whereas ESTJ is a guardian, and guardians are more likely to go by the book. And I yeah. think that the smarter the guardians are, the more methods they have for doing things, but those mm -hmm. methods tend to come from approved sources. Yeah. So it's like, oh, he says we do, so my mother has said about, well, she follows five different guardian experts. So it's five different authorities and she picks mm -hmm. the one that suits the situation. So I guess I heard you wrong. It's the statements you made prior to this. Um, I forgot what they were now, so forget it. You yeah, it's, it's me. I don't think in a straight line. I go all over the place and I confuse people by, by being confusing. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so, I yeah, agree so with everything you said there, by the way. So this stuff on the page there about what he wrote, what he said about his... Do you agree with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. So now we will go on to the second one. Uh, have you got any thoughts about this, Rachel? What he said here about why we have a type, that kind of thing? Who? Uh, Were you talking you, to me? Yes, you, Rachel. Do you have any uh, opinions about this, about why we have a type, that kind of thing? Um, no, yeah, I think that covers it. That's, okay. that's kind of what I've thought about on my own, too, just the mix of uh, your innate, you know, if you're born and, and you're, you're kind of like as a life form, you know, you're really intelligent where you're like, we're not going to be a really tall person with big <laughs> muscles. Like, we're not going to be going for that strategy. We don't feel very, like, you know power sense like we're not going to take on the world that way we're going to hang back we're going to rely on our mind a little bit and then as you go through those early experiences it's like in what way are you going to be an introvert or you know whatever however it is that makes yes. sense to me that makes total sense now to me this is this is massive to me this is huge i can give no a priori reason for selecting just these four Whereas a lot of socionics people would say that, oh, the functions are axiomatic. And he says, no, I came up with right. out of experience. All these right. big words are using, I can't, I don't even know what that means. Well, okay, axiomatic is like a axiomatic. premise that they think is a premise that's super true. 
and is mm -hmm. a priori in terms of this is a principle that exists and we don't even have to bother bother testing it it is the truth because it is oh. a priori it's like a universal it's like a truth that is I from think... reason that is don't need it's it's a very ti thing there's very, there are very few a priori that's truths. funny i actually thought about ni as yeah. well too with that ni and ti i think are the most like that I mean, you can get certain things where an a priori truth is something which doesn't need to be tested. So, for example, uh, 2 add 2 equals 4. That doesn't need to be tested to see if it's true. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. But, but this idea that there are a priori truths outside of mathematics is a little bit tricky. <laughs> Uh, I mean, well, anyways, that's how we feel, anyways, yeah. and uh, intuitively. <laughs> but, but I mean, having said that, I mean, he did pick four things that just happened to fall into a nice little system of opposites mm -hmm. sensing, intuition, thinking, feeling. Yeah. So, uh, and as he says there, I mean, this has shaped itself out of many years of experience. Uh, oh, yeah, this is interesting. From the energic standpoint, a function, a function is a phenomenon. A phenomenal form of the libido, which theoretically remains constant. Right, so basically the libido is, is psychic energy, which, mm -hmm. and I have a quote for people, and this is actually in Psychology of the Unconscious from the, uh, the translator. In other words, it's the libido that bestows upon the object that makes it, in, makes it attractive and interesting. So, for example, Say, in terms of love, it's like, why do I like this person? It's like, consciously, they're not in control of it. But it's like the libido, the interest has gone on there, unconsciously. Yeah. And the interest has followed the libido with it. It's like, um, the, uh, so I would say that libido, in terms of psychic energy, is unconscious. But mm -hmm. then we're only conscious of the interest that comes from uh, the yeah, libido. Yeah. That's, how mm -hmm. I, that's how I think of it. And it's just that, and this lines up with Model G, where the dominant function is the most energic one, the most with the most libidinous. <laughs> that's a value child statement there. Most one, the most energy for her lead function. So ENFJ has the most energy for FE. Right. And when on their territory, situationally, NI at close range is their strongest function at close range. So, right. because Victor sees it as extroverts, well, because they're extroverting, mm -hmm. they're going to be using more of their extroverted functions, whereas the introverted functions are conditional. Yeah. To when That's the, true. To when, to when That's they're right. I really like that, the way that was explained. So, if Carl Jung heard that, he might think, yes, you're right, Victor. I think I'll rearrange my model. <laughs> because he did, he did say in another thing where he does change his mind. They all change their minds, INTPs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Vanderhoek's right. an INTP. Von yeah. Franz was a, I, a TI dominant as well, so. Did, did uh, Vanderhoek uh, keep changing his mind? Or did he stick to... I don't... He only wrote, like, one book, so oh, I no, don't right. know. But he made it a point that, though, that he got his uh, ideas from many different people other than Carl Jung, and he disagreed with Jung on some things. That's the interesting thing. So That's subjective thinking, though. We will disagree with people. Like, yeah. I will disagree with Kersey. I mean, uh, uh, Kersey has a point when he says that Jung may have confused intuition with introversion, but I don't agree with Kersey, from at least a diagnostic point of view. But um, when it comes to Kretschmer, I, I disagree with Kersey that the schizothymes are intuitives. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that the schizothymes are introverts. And so Kretschmer's view on it backs up. So it's, it's from more a psych, uh, it's from a, um, a psychiatric point of view where you can mm -hmm. see extroversion and introversion. If you look at physique and character by uh, uh, Ernst Kretschmer. I so, honestly, I'm not a fan of uh, putting type two too much with like mental health issues because i do since we have all the functions in us you can get like any type that might be a schizo whatever that word is <laughs> yeah i mean he, yeah he, he thinks that basically basically he thought there was a strong connection between schizophrenia and introversion 
Yeah, and because Vanderhoop thinks that schizophrenics are anti dominant right off the bat. Yeah, I mean, Victor sometimes has these. The, it's more a case of patterns. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. It's, not, it's like the, there's. And so Kretschmar, he sort of came. So he looked at. Well, these types of people. Well, this temperament of people tends to go mad in this way. This tends to go. So it's like with Enneagram. Mm -hmm. Like eights tend to become psychos when they become like unhealthy. Like Fives yeah. tend to become schizophrenic. These kind of. Things. I think I have a message from somebody. Uh, happy enough just to, just to watch, but you're welcome to join as well, Amanda. I think you are in the chat and have access to the link, so you're welcome to join. Although she is busy revising, <clears throat> right then. So, any more? So there. So empirical, not a priori for the functions. I hope you're listening, you socialist people. You <laughs> model A. <laughs> Tell with him. your ti where you just pluck Tell you just pluck it out of thin air and it's like yes these are a priori functions no they're not so i think this is good this is a nice little example but then we need, we need to systematically explain why they're not because they say no one has done that yet no one has refuted this you know immutable truth that we have discovered it is proven it is credible they did the research so it's on the burden is on us. Ah, ah, well, apparently well, they have the mountain of research to, of why their functions well, are so well, uh, well, axiomatic. Yeah, but I They've said done to, it all. Yeah, but I They've said to Jack. But I said to Jack, will your definitions of the functions be different in ten years? And he said yes. And then I said, Well they're not axiomatic then. Yeah, in my opinion, they're just making it unnecessarily slow to change and they're just holding back progress. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like, like, as I said, it's like what I did that diagram with the premise and then the structural logic. They're focusing too much on the structural logic part, whereas the fact that INTPs, they take a premise and via structural logic, they try to prove it via the structural logic. And it's one of these things where they just happen to be good at structural logic as well as the introverted thing. So structural logic is a part of introverted thinking. It's just that they happen to be good at that because, because they're not towards the facts. The only way they can prove their concepts is through the logic and through reasoning. And so it's like a preference leads to practice and practice leads to development. Whereas somebody who is more TE will go more towards what is external. They might even learn mathematics because that, that is external, that is TE. You can say that mathematics, somebody else's mathematics and systems and algorithmic logic, you can say that's TE as well. Um, so here, um, I'm not so sure about Charles Darwin and Karl Marx being um, extroverted thinkers, but Ludwig Wittgenstein, definite TI user. <sighs> what is thinking? So this is how I see TI. Yeah. Wittgenstein is too dense for me. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't get into I it. I actually think... I, I, I think it's TI for sure. I think, so I'll say this to the socioscience model layers. Log I think the Tractatus, he was taking the piss <laughs> out of logic with the Tractatus by saying, well, with all of this logic, I can prove these things and solve all these philosophical problems. And then when he did, uh, I think it was philosophical investigations, he basically said, no, this is word games. This is just logic and arranging things. We're not actually getting towards the truth of it. Right. So, right. You probably, it, it, it is lots of TI. It's lots of the structural logic of track takers. Somebody pinged me a message. So, uh, any thoughts? Okay. Um, Amanda, you are sending me messages during the hangout, and I'll read them later. Uh, or you could put them in the chat. It'd, it'd be better if you if you if you put them in the live stream chat. I will send you the thing, and you can post them in there, and people can benefit from your uh, wisdom. Copy, Rambox, Amanda. If you paste it there, because I know she's watching at the moment, she said so. If you do it in the live stream of that. Then I can. Then other people can see your comments. And I'll look at them later. So, any any thoughts on this? From both of you, formulate questions and seek to understand their own being. And neglect the world and dwell on their own ideas. Direct themselves towards others in accordance with fixed rules and principles. They're interested in reality, order, and material facts. 
Is that fair enough? Who are we talking about here? Well, this is the, the TE on the left and TI okay. on the right. Okay. Right. Pretty much extroverted and introverted thinking. Okay. So again, so I was going to show this. I might as well show this now. Uh, this is from a simplified introducing young book. It's like, uh, oh, audio to camera, young, the key ideas book. It gets some things wrong, like it says that the inferior function is unconscious. Well, Jung wrote only in the person who's neurotic, and only yeah. then is it principally unconscious. Me, I'm just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon? Never mind, sorry. Okay, okay. So we've got here, so introversion and extroversion. So the subject, this is the thing, introverts withdraw psychic energy from the world and direct it towards the subject. They're in, a, in, a, in a, so all subjective. They're more interested in their own inner world of thoughts and feelings than the external world. Their behavior mm -hmm. is governed mainly by subjective factors. Yeah. And then this is arguable with Kretschmer. An extreme form of introversion appears in autism and some types of schizophrenia. Kretschmer wrote about that. That's one of these things which is uh, debatable. But you, you get it in Enneagram Type Five. When the Enneagram Five, it's like too much too much ti and they get separate it's one of these things where there's little bits of overlap and it's not always the uh, 100 percent lined up uh right extroverts naturally give their greatest attention now there's a little bit of overlap here between extroversion and the concept of sensor uh to the object they're interested in the external world and relationships and their behavior tends to be governed by objective factors uh, as I said with uh, carol you can have objective intuition that's basically the stimulus comes from the outside and it's usually about possibilities in the external world and in terms of socially intelligent roles yeah you get entps involved in inventing stuff so as a general summary remember also that subjective means to do with or coming from the self an object mm -hmm. me objective means to do with or coming from the external world so what i would say to the model a is in the way they de define ti they make it sound like it can never be wrong. But I would say, but look at all these philosophers arguing with each other and being proven to be wrong. Yeah. That shows how subjective it is. Whereas in science, right. there's less, fewer scientists are wrong about stuff in science because it's more objective. Um, but as I said before, INTPs can, can it's almost they use the structural mm. logic part of ti to do the systems thinking and that kind of stuff and that part of ti is more objective right right but I have a sounds like... oh sorry go ahead it's okay you were first i was just gonna say it sounds like what we need to do is is create like i would like to like compile a paper because it's like what we're talking about is like the metaphysics of yeah life. like we're, we're arguing with kind of the way that socionics is defining things like in a basic sense like introverted what the, what is the meaning of introverted and extroverted why are why are introverted thinking and introverted feeling functions that are concerned with external objects yeah that really confuses me it's like we need to talk about metaphysics like what we need to define our terms and like we're kind of trying to make the argument that also, objects and fields and objects and bodies was a metaphor from physics. Yeah, go on, Rachel. I was just going to say, if you're talking about introversion, you're, you're talking about away from the objects directed inwards towards subjects. So yeah, that's where the interest that's, lies. That's, and so many people define introversion that way. You know? Well, that's what I do. I mean, we, with introverted thinking, I'll read something young. And then I'm like, well, what do I think about it? And then I'll make my own connection so it goes away from what he was thinking and then towards what I was thinking. So it becomes exactly. my own subjective thing, whereas more extroverted logic, they're going more towards, well, this is what was written. So it's just a, it's so with TI, it's just a starting point for my own thoughts and speculations. Right. It seems like extroverted thinking would have more to do with comparing it against other external proven, more solid, like, evidence, like putting it in the arena of other thoughts in an external way, and then seeing kind of how those interact. Um, yeah. Like, 
like in the science community, like once you publish something, it's like the extrovert thinking seems to be the process of like measuring everything yeah. against the external standards and seeing how everything compares to that and like kind of. Um, I like all yeah, that I stuff. I, I think it's great, all that proper stuff, because it's like it, it, it gets rid of bad thinking and it's by well, trying to disprove a theory and all that kind of stuff. Right. Because when you're coming up with a theory, you're going to be thinking, oh, there's going to be loads of people trying to disprove this. I better make sure it's airtight. Yeah. I better test it myself before I'm ridiculed by all these right. peers. Right. So I would say it seems like with the TE, it's like, if you're trying to present TE information, when you're presenting the information, you're putting it into those terms that everybody can already kind of agree on. Like there's these set definitions for what things already mean. Whereas with introverted thinking, like when I'm studying Kant, it's like you need to understand why Kant defined things the way he defines yeah. things. And that's why the book is thousand pages long, because you have to read all this context to understand why you know he's reasoning things out the way he is and exactly what he means by his terms like very very specifically because it's not standardized it's not you're not going to understand the way his definitions are in the same way as like the way someone else defines the very same words like it's unique it's like subjective it's like this chapter is 100 pages and it goes through Carl Jung going through his definition I actually wish it was twice as long <laughs> to get a little bit more explanation so there's those are the bits i've read so far the ones in yellow are the ones i've read so far of the uh, the definitions chapter in uh psychological types i have a question go on where would you put comprehension like as far as because i feel like sometimes with me i come some a young in and I come into, especially MBTIers, I come into contact with like, not everybody's going to agree with what Young said. And for me, it's not about going directly by the book. It's more about taking the comp, taking, not miscomprehending what Young was trying to say versus uh, agreeing with him. Now, if you read the material and you disagree with him, that's one thing. But it's like if they miscomprehended something he said, because later he'll give an example to prove that they're not even comprehending it right. Where would you put miscomprehension? Would you put that in the realm of TI or like just thinking period? Like where does that go? Because I deal a lot with comprehension. Right. Um, this is going to be one of these things where, okay, so the way I understand things, and I think the way NPs understand things, when they come across something new, they try to understand it in terms of something they already know. So it's right. like, oh, this is like this. So I remember when I was at university and we were introducing a new subject, mm -hmm. I would understand it before other people. But then as the subject went along and other people had better memories, they then went, went past me. They either level with me or went somewhere. With you. Whereas when it was a new thing, but that's because I could relate it to something I already knew. Now, there's a strength in that, but there's also a problem in that you only pick out those things which are commonalities with what you already know. Right. Whereas there might be specific details that are highly important. So uh, I think there's those who are, say, ISTP. Mm -hmm. you also, you're going to get general intelligence involved as well, such as like the ability to follow a logical strand from right. the premises. That's one thing. There's mm -hmm. also then the ability. So, for instance, when I read, so I wrote this down for how I've been understanding Jung. Mm -hmm. uh, so to understand a complex sentence of Jung's, I arrange his ideas pictorially in my mind's eye because of the nuance and the caveats and the analogues. Mm -hmm. And also, you've seen how I've been highlighting things where yeah. it's like, okay, this is where he's talking about it, this, and then this is where he's talking about the opposite. Mm -hmm. So just trying to arrange it in my mind's eye. And I think in order to understand Jung properly, I'm going to have to, once I've read the definitions, I'm going to have to diagram it all out as this is what he wrote about abstraction. This is what he wrote about thinking in terms of directed thinking and non-directed thinking and all of these things and how these ideas link up together. So it's a little bit like Peter Schiff, listening to Peter Schiff, which I've listened to since 2009, where you've got all of these different ideas and how they link together. So that's the thing. It's a long process to but understand Young. But I don't know if you answered my question directly with 
comprehension like like is that even like would that go to ti or more te comprehension, comprehension? oh it's, it's, it's difficult to say um i think i would say ti people would more likely to look at it well if they're ti with any the internal consistency and the similarities with things that they already know right so for example mm -hmm. when i'm understanding young mm -hmm. it's a big help that i've read some philosophy because right. he uses quite a bit of philosophy and the same mm -hmm. thing with rachel she can understand what jung's talking about mm -hmm. with objective and subjective because she's read kant so right. is that thing that other knowledge uh the t oh, you go on i feel like when i was reading young i intuitively grasped what he meant and then later mm. on i figured i was right but it also could be because it was like that with and i whereas with any i was way off so it could also be that our cognition might make us also more prone to grasping things i don't know yeah, I, that just, can happen. I, I agree with that yeah. I, that's why i am such a Jungian. that's why closeonics frustrates me because i do already resonate so deeply with young and especially same like when thing I with me <laughs> I was reading the book, the essay that he wrote on synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading about synchronicity, I was on a plane getting ready mm -hmm. to take off. And what the passage I was reading was about levitation and someone flying on mm -hmm. a plane. And I was reading those lines as I was taking off on the plane. And I'm like, there it is. Synchronicity. synchronicity. Yeah. That's about. That's exactly. It it, mm -hmm. It's plain as day to me. I'm like, I already know this. this yeah. Is how I already the world and i came I work go ahead oh that's it i mean i'm just saying yeah yeah because i came i have been new about synchronicity since i was 15. i've been a spiritual teacher since i was a 15 year old so i kind of waltzed into young and stuff I'm like oh and i that's how my and i manifest spirituality yeah. clairvoyance stuff like that so i was just like okay whatever so of course i understood and i but i'm just yeah. thinking like maybe i intuitively understood what he was saying but I'm just trying to wonder if TI dominants are more so to be, or TI period is it's what makes us more focused on comprehension versus TE, where it's dealing with facts as they are laid before us. You know what I mean? Whereas, whereas TI deals with more abstract thinking, like the yeah. context. Well, the word comprehension is comprehensive. TI, mm -hmm. I think, mm. seeks comprehensive knowledge. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it wants to know how everything fits together. Comprehension. You want it to all, you know, click and make sense. Yeah. Uh, there's and also think, a thing. Yeah. There's also that. Just, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it. but what they do at school is, especially in science, they teach you the same thing again and again, but at different levels of complexity. It's like mm -hmm. you'll learn about photosynthesis. And then in more and then eventually you'll get up to the electron transport chain thing <laughs> as you get older but they're always like the different going over the same material but at different levels of complexity uh so that's one of the things that people will do and, and it's like when people get into a new subject they'll read the introductory guide and yeah and then they'll, as they go on they realize well that was a bit simple and they actually had that wrong but it was enough just to get you over those first steps mm -hmm. To move along i actually have one more thing to say just one more thing and i want your input your opinion um now i read i think it vanderhoop's book and von france where the entj the ni makes the entj more apt like more open to theoretical thinking that's what he said and mm. the entj links more over to philosophy like i forgot i think it was voltaire one of them like spent their whole life picking apart Christianity. Like, so I'm wondering, like when you say TI, it's like INTP, you're more like theoretical. It's crazy because he also says ENTJ can be, but how do you think a theoretical TE dominant would look? Well, I mean, that's end, you've got general, general NT stuff where mm -hmm. it's like, I mean, Kurzweil would talk about their speech factorial. So mm -hmm. factorial that you want to get all the factors that pertain to the issue, and the the, the way they uh, the the way they argue, the way they reason tends to be deductive, mm -hmm. and they're analytical as well. So it's like let's get to the root of this issue, and that's the trend. Right. And it's the 
NT is. Mm -hmm. uh, generally with the NTJ, it's going to be, they still want to, they can do the TI stuff, but they want to apply it because they are interested in money. But it depends on what field they get into. I mean, is it not true? <laughs> maybe no, their theories not. are like more like inferences. Like maybe their theories are more based on what they've based on things that everybody's like concluded or things that can be like observed more so than uh -huh. analyzing things. It's more like, like internally. I don't know. <laughs> trying, yeah, I, mean, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I can't put it in a word. You know, they could have strong NI moments and believe that something mm -hmm. is true. Yeah. And then go to the phrase. I love this phrase from Trey Gowdy. It was a public prosecutor and now he's a Fox News contributor. The factual predicates. Yeah, so that's the TE yeah. -E thinking as factual predicates, whereas the TEI thinking just has stuff they've pulled out their backside. <laughs> just on the premise or concept that they like. I mean, at its root, but also they can do the structural stuff as yeah. well. Like when I said, when they get towards designing or with computing, mm -hmm. then there's not the subjective premise involved. But there is a tendency of, oh, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that in terms of the idea generation? Yeah. And that. So yeah, I mean, I've got questions here from Amanda and it's, oh, uh, yeah, on, go on. Quick, just to recap. Yeah, go on. Just to recap, the TI seems to be more like the why and getting into all the, the background, whereas like TE seems to just be concerned with the what works. What yeah. Works, yeah. What yeah. Works. yeah. That's, that's also a, an ST thing as well. So for instance, yeah. in NLP, they, they, they don't like why questions. They like how questions. Yeah, it's TP, especially. Yeah. Yeah, ESTP, yeah. Right. And they've got strong, again, because they're thinking extroverts. Mm -hmm. and, when, and certainly when they're smart, they show really good uh, TE. And, now, they can, and they can act like the NTJs. It's just that they act quicker and less strategically, more tactically. I had an ESTP. This is probably not politically correct of me, but there was an e I have an ESTP friend who said that TE dominants are stupid. Right. Like he thinks they're dumb. Cause right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. so that's yeah. interesting to me yeah i've heard that from there used to be this youtuber called ej aaron d and he would say the same uh -huh. thing where mainly he's thinking about estjs in terms mm -hmm. of um being by the book now voitech a degree in computational physics talking about his father saying his father was estj and he says initially he didn't believe his father when he said he read a book every book in poland on a particular subject but again the smart sj is they go to authorities. So it's mm -hmm. like, I think the smart the SJ is, the more they go to different authorities and the more right. they pick the one. Because it's like, well, what does this expert think? Mm -hmm. I'll choose the one that fits this situation. Yeah, I agree. Right, right. So it's almost as if they've got more algorithms. <laughs> They're a smarter robot in their thinking. I also must say that it makes sense to me that the well, this is off topic a little bit that the te dominants are probably like coldest because the fi is like they're inferior they could come off cross like the coldest type i don't know yeah but it depends on development though i mean it's like it like like we said before with situationally they can develop it so i think that's a development thing with it's just uh, the way young the way young yeah. says that even fi dominance can come across kind of like Teach yeah. because they're not expressive and stuff. I don't know. It's just it, it. It might also be that it might also be a thing where te drums tend to get into business, mm -hmm. and business itself tends to be a field which yeah. like puts people's feelings in second place. Right. Although Peter Schiff would say you gotta please please your customers or you yeah. will go out of business exactly <laughs> and, and the government the government doesn't have much of an incentive to please its customers whereas that every business person is thinking every day how best to please their customers yeah but i would say to peter schiff what about monsanto what about those people who came up with aspartame because they're not very good to their customers poisoning them <laughs> now i have a question for you as a ti dominant go on then because I don't understand this on you guys. How do you navigate through the world? Like, how do you decide? Difficulty. What, as far as you know, as far as behavior goes, how do you decide what the right and wrong thing to do in behavior is? As far as like, I don't want to say morals, but like. Well, like, I, 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 it's well. 
that's more of a problem with the NTPs. But I think interaction style, usually INTPs are accommodating, so they don't really want to take risks. So they, the model A would see it as they can interact in a slightly robotic fashion and sort of stick to the, vote, to the social norms. Um, there is a little bit of a, a feeling in us, and it is a feeling, oh, that's not the right thing, that's not appropriate. And when we do tend to be inappropriate, it's because we're too flipping enthusiastic. And so we did this thing about, I did this thing with Wojtek, how should INTPs act on Facebook? And, <laughs> and I talked about, when I meet somebody new, it's like, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, I did that with you, Shalene. And it's like, well, you might be interested in this, it might be yeah, interested it's in that. And then it's too much, it's too much. <laughs> yeah. What I need to do is I need to pass it out and put it in the diary, send it yeah. and send it out that tweet. It's like, it's no, just, but I mean, how does the TI navigate you as your dominant function through the world, through life? Like, that's the problem. That's the problem, isn't it? Because it's, I mean, I mean, like this. Not really I mean, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like we come up with a system about the world. Right. But we're more into the system than the thing it actually represents oh, the world. Okay. So we, if, again, it's development as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the anything, the, the situational thing, like at the moment, I'm on my territory. I'm talking about something I'm interested in with other people who, with something I'm interested in. But all INTPs are going to have a problem with, with small talk and talking right. about and any conversation that doesn't include ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess I'll have to That's settle. The problem. That's the problem yeah, INTPs what? can have. You know, you could be an INTP that grew up in like a real social family <laughs> and you have a system for understanding that, maybe, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the ISTPs kind of INTP are even like, worse. Huh? The ISTPs are even worse about it. Yeah, yeah, because of the, yeah. the weak NE. Um, so, as people can see here, extroverted thinking type, type dominated by rational thinking and logic. These, and like I said, factual predicates, I would say. And then also, we've got to bring temperament in, like, it's extroverted thinking with NI. How are things going to develop, develop strategic thinking into the, into the future? And yeah. then also if you have TE in the STJs, it's more standard operating procedure, right. following an algorithm. Because hmm. uh, they want to stick with the tried and true or switch to a different expert depending on the situation. Uh, rational thinking, logic, yeah, all this kind of stuff. Boring TE stuff, unimaginative <laughs> TE stuff. <laughs> Just like Carl Jung, factual predicates. Now, this is where it's Telepathy like... Telepathy is the only interesting part of TE. <laughs> yeah, that's what Carl Jung does as well. I mean, when we get onto it, he does. He's just like, ah, boring, I'd rather talk about TI. Um, so this type is also interested in intellectual ideas, but it's oriented more towards the inner world of ideas than external facts. These people are by nature... Now, this is much more INTP, though, than ISTP. But of course, you can get intellectual ISD. And I make a distinction between intelligent and intellectual. Intellectual is more in the case of interested in ideas and stuff. Whereas right. I think the guy with the highest IQ might be ISTP. I think it's called Chris Langham or something. And he's on the uh, internet. I think he's got the highest IQ and he uh, resembles ISTP. So um, uh, thinking is directed inwards towards subjective ideas. And as I tell the sociologists people, I will think for myself. I'm right. not going to follow the party line. Even some things in Vits, I'm like, eh, I'm not going to worry. You may have been the functional tail wagging the dog there, but I'm respectful. And even with Kersey, I'll disagree with Kersey. I think you're wrong there with Kretschmer. Or I'll say, so thinking for yourself. And again, that goes with the utilitarian thing. NTs and SPs will think for themselves. See, that's uh, where I struggle with TI because I'll get, I'll have all these personal opinions and things like this is wrong and this is wrong and this is not what young men and stuff. But then I'll be like, I'll run into situations where I could tell people are getting up in arms about their type and I will be at odds with them. So I'll just refrain from saying anything at all because I don't right. want to create tension that's between me and other people. Yeah. 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 Like it stinks. Yeah, I mean, I tend to, when that happens to me is I just go, I just say, well, it's only about resemblance. You can, <laughs> so it's like I distance myself from the whole concept of time. Yeah. yeah. I bring that up so much. I bring that up so much in the Flow State Discord that, like, because they were talking about in the diagnostics channel, they were talking about typing uh, countries or like societies. Oh, and they God. Were, like, mm -hmm. 
they were talking about how, oh, well, it's kind of like, they can definitely be like half of this type's values and half of like another quadra's values. And I'm like, okay, so we can talk about it for countries and societies, but we can't be open-minded to the idea that individuals might also not be in the hard lines of like, you know, the, the singular type. We can't think of people also as like being resembling, you know, maybe a couple of types. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sure, they might have a strong preference to one, but maybe they do have some resemblance to others and that can be okay and it doesn't have to threaten the whole model, but they act like just that mere implication that there That's might true. be some similarities to another type in different situations. Like Ben's You're, talking about, I think it's a more yeah. holistic understanding that you can understand that you yes, have pattern. kind of like a core type, but in different situations, you might act like different types. Exactly. Yeah. And also it goes into knowing human beings, just being human in general. You're not yeah. going to always specifically yeah. just act like one thing like that. So it's not even realistic it's, when you know humanity, like we're whole. Yeah, we had this thing yeah. where um, I think we've got certain people, haven't we, Rachel, typing me as EII, so F-I-N-X. And they're probably saying things like, oh, he doesn't like introverted thinking. Therefore, he doesn't value it. No, it's like, I don't like your definition, which yeah. for INTP I reasons I think is not sophisticated enough. Yeah, Ben, I'm noticing that anyone that comes into that chat who has questions and doubts is getting typed as EII or IEE. -E. <laughs> Everyone who has doubts about what they're saying, like any kind of questions, oh, you just don't have good TI, you don't value that, you're trying to say that you're individual and can't be categorized so therefore you're definitely IEE -E or EII. <laughs> and there's a lot of psychological things that go into this stuff, into typing. It's so complicated. It took it, me it like so four years to finally figure out my true type because I had to sift through all this nonsense. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I've been like, in that phase yeah. for years as well. It's childhood stuff. It's where, how you were raised. It's this, it's that. It's the fact that we're yeah. human in general and Blah, 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 like... I, I think you'll let me show this because it's like a public group that everyone theoretically can see, but this is a post today by David Mark Kersey. So here, here he is going towards the structural logic. So even this, even though this goes against what, what I've been saying about the subjective premise, this is more him going towards the structural part of it. But you're still going to have the ideas and the subjective factors. So you've got here... Um, uh, this guy is so much <laughs> like Hello. <laughs> the the actual Kersey INTP was based on this guy. So uh, here we go. Never accept an idea as long as you yourself are not satisfied with its consistency and the logical structure on which its concepts are based. That bit, I'm not so sure that all of the concepts are based on a logical structure because he himself would argue with his father about dichotomies in that he thought that they were a distribution, a polarity, whereas his father thought that they were a dichotomy. So he had two INTPs there arguing over INTP still, over definitions and things like that. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is that thing where, like I said, so when he get, got into science, there he's using the logical part of his TI and the less subjective part of his uh, TI. But definitely when it comes to philosophy, where the structural logic is based on premises and concepts, that's more subjective factor, which is why there's so much variation in philosophy and people arguing with each other and lots of philosophers being proved wrong. Uh, yeah. uh, so we will, did we will you, go on. Ben, did you hear about the uh introverted thinking's uh inferior function? How sometimes you guys can get clingy ish and like the ISTP can get like stalker ish if he's really really unhealthy? ISTP, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because like any any break, just like on that one thing, and I actually know mm -hmm. about one that's happened in real life, but I won't go into it. But yes, ISTP can get, but also can, so can INTJ as well. They can right. get a bit, bit stuck, it's like focused on one person. They were talking about inferior extrovert at feeling and TI dominance. So how you guys will either try to think your feelings away or you'll like completely throw yourself into a relationship and make yourself look silly potentially by, uh, whoever your romantic interest is i don't know i was reading about that it's um, possible it's, it's possible with the 
with, with the uh, thinking introverts is definitely possible because the, the, the feeling functions or what we put in those buckets are not as sophisticated because you don't live in that world as much. Uh, so this is an example. So the way they define TI, the, the, don't know, Rachel, the way they define TI is as a thing that has to be 100% true, doesn't it? But you've got Carl Jung here saying, eh, I wasn't right. I'll change my mind. Because <laughs> this is where he's writing about libido. With this, I acknowledge my early idea of the identity of autism. There's, there's talking about um, autism there. And also eroticism, Freud, as unjustified. And therefore, I retract it. Because, you know, it's not structural logic that's 100% true. The way the definition would go. And in fact, the way socionics defines TI, it makes it sound a little bit too much like TE. And therefore, what they do is then define TE as business logic. Yeah. Right. Although, TJs do tend to have an interest in business. Um, e and TJs might be uh, interested in religion, yeah. universe, like Christianity and stuff like that. I don't know. <laughs> right. So now we actually get on to the start <laughs> of okay. Jung and we will eventually um get through this but so this is where carl Jung he starts talking about extroverted intuition or thinking in the extroverted attitude and uh i'll uh do you want to read it shalina and then comment on it as you go through i don't even see anything i've just been listening you read things out loud. all right all right if maybe if you click on any squares that maybe you can uh if you click on my square or actually the okay. square of the other Ben. If you click on the square of the other Ben, then you'll see Okay, I see going. it now. I see right. it now. Because I'm, I'm thinking if you read it through, then you can stop and comment on it. Okay, what am I reading? As well, a where result? it says, as a result of the general attitude of extra Okay, version. read it aloud or just read it to myself? Well, read it out loud, please. Because okay, then you can as, stop and comment on it. Okay, as a result of the general attitude of extraversion, thinking is orientated by the object and the objective data. This orientation of thinking produces a noticeable peculiarity. Thinking in general is fed from two sources, firstly from subjective and in the last resort unconscious roots, and secondly from objective data transmitted through sense perceptions. I can't comprehend while I'm reading out loud. <laughs> oh, then okay. Uh, I can't. Well, I've got an idea. If I read it out and then you can put your hand up and I'll shut my gob and then you okay. can talk. And if I do that with both of yeah. you. We both put your hand up and then I'll stop and then you you say you say something uh, okay. about what because you know you, you've got Rachel who's got the interest in Jung and Kant and then you've got the, the breadth of knowledge with Jung so thinking in general is fed from two sources I, I, I said, said that <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. but I didn't I don't understand like I wasn't okay. comprehended while I was reading it so you can start over okay so as a result of the general attitude of extroversion thinking is oriented by the object and objective data the, uh, what did he call it? The, the factual predicate. This orientation of thinking produces a noticeable peculiarity. Yeah, he really doesn't like extroverted thinking. Thinking in general is fed from two sources. Firstly, from subjective and in the last resort, unconscious roots. Um, and secondly, from objective data transmitted through the sense, sense perceptions. Extroverted thinking is conditioned in a large measure by these latter factors than by the former. Judgment always presupposes a criterion. For the extroverted judgment, the valid and determining criterion is the standard taken from objective conditions. No matter whether this be directly represented by an objectively perceptible fact or expressed in an objective idea. Ah, what he means by objective idea is ideas that people believe in and is generally yeah. accepted as true. Right. Uh, so for instance, certain ideas in physics, people have accepted as this is true, and then it gets disproven or partially disproven. Mm -hmm. uh, expressed as in an objective idea for an, ob for an objective idea. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, it's directly represented by an objectively perceptible fact or expressed in an, ob an objective idea for an objective idea, an interesting nuance or when subjectively sanctioned is equally external and objective in origin. Ah, interesting. Yeah, it's like with religion. It becomes objective if everyone believes in it. Yeah. And it's external to the person in that it's not their own subjective thinking or ethical system or anything like that. 
Uh, extroverted thinking, therefore, uh, need not necessarily be merely concretist thinking. It may equally well be purely ideal thinking. If, for instance, it can be shown that the ideas with which it is engaged are to a great extent borrowed from without, i.e. are transmitted by tradition and education. Now that is an interesting nuance. I also feel like that particular area, I'm inclined to think that ENTJs are more so, that part is more so like in relation to ENTJ as far as the idealistic, uh, the ideal, purely ideal thinking. Like for instance, like a philosophy, a general philosophy that's accepted by everybody. Whereas ESTJs, I think Custer Sensors are more so interested in ideas that are put into like law and stuff like that, that are mm. put into a uh, practice in the world where ENTJs are more comfortable maybe in the purely ideal thinking. I don't know. What yeah, do I think? mean, yeah, I mean, if we've got ideal in terms of looking towards the future, they're utilitarian, they're going to be thinking more for themselves. Almost as if using external facts for their own ends, their, uh, their own ends being long term strategic goals. And they're, they're, they want to use practical thinking in order to achieve long term goals, but they've also got a strategic intellect. And so we'll maybe use uh, complicated ideas and techniques and intellectual things as tools to achieve long term objectives. Because it's still about applying their intellect mm -hmm. to the external world. Right. Uh, yeah, again, borrowed from without. So what the weird thing is, you can have people learning loads of TI philosophers, but it becomes objective because it's from without to yeah. them, because it's what's been learned. So borrowed from without are transmitted by tradition and education. The criterion of judgment, therefore, as to whether or no a thinking is extroverted hangs directly upon the question. Dun, dun, dun. Which standard is its judgment governed? Is it furnished from without or is its origin subjective? Are you thinking for yourself? Are you feeling yeah. for yourself? Sensing for yourself, intuiting for yourself. So when you intuit for yourself, it really is coming from within your own personal unconscious and maybe a connection with the collective unconscious by our archetypes. Right. Uh, and then we've got here, a further criterion is afforded by the direction of the thinker's conclusion. Namely, whether or no the thinking has a preferential direction outwards. Okay, so it's going to be more practical. Right, because they're still, their overall attitude is extroverted. So, mm -hmm. so there, there, there will be a tendency for their thinking to want to go towards something which is applicable. I have a petty question. Go on then. Why does he say whether or no instead of whether or not? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I would have put not. It was just old. It's old English weird kind of stuff. But I'll try to get I, in touch I, with him in the afterlife and yeah. see why. <laughs> yeah, and I am. But yeah, I mean, um, uh, on the NI hotline, uh, <laughs> with um, sometimes you hear it say where whether or no. Uh, yeah, but usually it, you it would be not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is. I mean, sometimes people might say it in order to stand out, uh, but they might look a bit weird. <laughs> right. It's just it's going, if it's from there or is it subjective? Is it your own thinking? Now, again, we can, we, we can say, okay, Ben, how does this show itself in real life? Well, NTPs, they think for themselves. Who else thinks for themselves? STPs. They will think in the moment and think, how am I going to solve this my way? Thinking for themselves. So that, that's one of the key features of TI thinking right. for yourself and it comes through in again ntps they'll come up with their own theories their own do things their own way and the stps do things their own way so it so what what you've got there is the definition lines up with the evidence of the types right so when it comes to rumors and things like that do you think that's like tertiary or, or poor te when people just accept rumors as they are do you think that's like TE yeah. stuff. Yeah, TE and FE stuff, and depending on who it comes from, okay. uh, that kind of thing. Because uh, who is telling you the rumor is going to be. Just like rumors, like 
celebrity stuff, like universal, like universal rumors about different things, like information about celebrities and about people, just rumors in general. Yeah, I mean, usually rumors are started, in my opinion, by things, and the rumor that starts is something that fits in with a, a preconceived idea of somebody. Mm -hmm. So if someone's a little bit of a jug at it, someone will start rumors about all of these things that fit in with the image of right. that and therefore mm -hmm. probably it's more believable i just can't imagine when i think about ti a person coming to a ti dominant and being like hey i heard this and this about this person <laughs> no, no you know right. and a ti right. dominant be like well i'm gonna form my own opinion about yeah. such and such yeah i mean uh and an estp especially will rip people to shreds if their thinking isn't i mean the the really smart estps they can uh cut people down i mean dario has shown from the brain research they have the most activity in the region that aids with deduction so you right. can see them in like poker players that's a, uh -huh. a good that is a professional poker player is a good profession for escp i yeah, love got poker that. yeah it's a good profession yeah. for them and that might mm -hmm. be an example of where you've got the psychology aspects of poker mm -hmm. and the mathematical aspects so again one of these situational things where the functional preference can come out because my go ahead i'm just saying it's the inferior function and its use tends to be situational mm -hmm. yeah my only issue with uh estps is they can be a bit simple simpletons and like yeah. they are smart but they can come across very too practical to the point where you're not i don't yeah yeah where you're yeah. not you're too simplistic thinking yeah, and as I said before, the the, uh, the smarter ESTJs will have more sources, will read more books, mm -hmm. they'll go to more experts, and they can actually have this huge knowledge base because they like reading. I mean, I, I mean, I could say that SJs like reading because you go to the top twenty books, top twenty political books on Amazon. Most of them are conservative, and I'm thinking about history and American history, and I'm thinking, okay, this is mainly SJs reading this stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. because part of that is it's part of that introverted sensing stuff. They mm -hmm. love conjuring those images up in their mind from sensory detail. They love novels yeah. with a huge amount of sensory detail. Mm -hmm. My mother told me that she can imagine smells easily. Right, and whereas I've asked other people, this is a big effort to imagine yeah. a particular smell. Whereas, you know, so. That's where novels, so they like reading. Again, it's that introverted sensing thing and imagination, especially if it's describing things that have already experienced, then they can conjure those images up. Right. Uh, I mean, when it's things that's more imaginative, like say science fiction with, um, then it can be done. Although that you can get the NE come through in SI DOMS. So what have we got here? Right, and then he's, he's going off on one. What have, what have I written here? Boring, unoriginal tea. <laughs> tea. That's how he describes it later on. But yes, I mean, from an INTP's point of view, unoriginal as heck. Right. Well, but it has some truth to it, though. Yeah, to yeah, a but degree. You, yeah, but they might say, though, the, ES, the smart ESTJ might say, yeah, I'm following this standard operating procedure because it's worked and it's written by this expert who's been very successful that is, we might say like this, oh, I, I got it in this book by Jack Welsh, and he's a very successful businessman, and I'm going to follow it, and I'm going to do it efficiently, and ESTJs are effective in that way. I just think that the... Uh, they're the very smart... effective, but they're yeah. not necessarily original. I agree yeah. with the unoriginal part. Now, whether yeah. somebody wants to take offense to that, that's different, but I do think it's unoriginal. Yeah, team. they are unoriginal. It's just, the way, it's just the way it is, because you're going towards standard operating procedure, because you're not trying to be original you're trying to be effective and exactly. get stuff done so it's right. what you value mm -hmm. whereas for nts they value originality more because part of the keyword self-image in kersey ingenuity for mm -hmm. nts especially ntps who are more interested in the ingenuity part than achieving long-term goals right. the way the ntjs are um so here we go it is no proof uh direction outwards of thinkers conclusion namely whether or not we're thinking as a preferential okay here we go it is no proof of the extroverted nature that it is preoccupied with concrete objects 
since I may be engaging my thoughts with a concrete object either because I am extracting my thought from it or because I am concretizing my thoughts with it. Now, that's one of these aspects. That's where Carl Jung has got very nuanced. So no, I don't um, understand this part. Yeah, I will um, give an example. I admit that TE might, might have been one portion of his book that I just kind of skimmed across. Right, I just okay. don't have any patience for it. Right, right. so it's talking about abstracting thought. So mm -hmm. you can be... Uh, see, uh, you can be focused on a phenomenon and then abstractify the key components mm -hmm. to analyze it. And so in a sense, you're still being objective because you're abstractifying from the object, but you are withdrawing a little bit of interest from the object, but you're still abstractifying something that, what did, what did Trey say? What did he call it? I forgot. Factual predicate. <laughs> yeah. You've got the factual predicate and you're abstractifying the factual predicate. So uh, I'll go through that again. Extra it means to correct by concrete objects and maybe engaging my thoughts with a concrete object, either because I am abstracting my thought from it. Okay, what are the implications of this fact? How does this fact fit in with my other system of knowledge? What What is the significance of this fact? Especially when it's T with NT. NTJs are going to think, what is the significance of this fact? Yeah, yeah. Because you got the because now he's writing about abstraction with thinking, but abstractions and uh, bound up with intuitives the way we understand it now because it's what comes through in tests. Nearly mm -hmm. all intuitives are abstract. NFs tend to be more abstract when it comes to ethics and emotions and self development and things like that. And right. NT is with like, his strategic thinking systems and organization uh, and then or because i am concrete this is a tricky one concrete concretizing my thought with it okay so that might be an example you know when uh, you're having a discussion with somebody and you mm. ask for an example yeah. and the example clarifies things yeah and the example is based in the real world so you can say that is an object from the real mm. world we're not experiencing it right now but it's a personal example that concretizes the theory in the example, which is an object, I suppose. That drives ob me crazy. Yeah, it is objective. I mean, I assume Jeff is being true when he tells me these stories that SJs are always telling them about their medical problems. <laughs> so that, so yeah, that is true. a concrete example of introverted sensing being yeah. in touch with bodily harmony. So there you go, concretize the subject. <laughs> Comfort sensing is concretized in the example of they will talk about their medical problems. Are those true? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Just like people will say, can you give me a concrete example? Um, even if I engage my thinking with concrete things and to that extent could be described as extroverted, it's like the scientist as well. The INTP scientist is still going to look at data, but mm -hmm. it's then their interest is going to go then away from the data and more towards interpretation. And then right. maybe, well, what does this mean for the theory? Oh, maybe there's a theory. But based on that, they might think of a theory. Oh, this could mean this, 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 yeah. this, this, and this. Um, uh, even if I engage my thinking with concrete things and to that extent could be described as extroverted, it yet remains both questionable and characteristic as regards the direction my thinking will take. Namely, where it is further course leads back again to the objective data. That's not what I said. The INTP will take the objective data, but then it comes a springboard for their introverted thinking. Right. Whereas the extroverted thinker will stay more with the data longer and maybe mm -hmm. the practical implications of it rather right. than what are the theoretical implications of it. But that will vary in, as to whether the TE with is with and I, SI, SI. yeah, is, is whether it's guardian at TE or whether it's NT. Uh, again, NTJs tend to use concepts for their mm -hmm. applicability. So he wrote about the mastermind, crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, INTJs submit every idea to the test of usefulness. There you go. There you go. There's an example of the, temp uh, the temperament aspect of INTJ and going towards practical goals. They submit every idea to the test of usefulness. So the, N the NT aspect comes through in their interesting ideas, but they have to be useful, so applicable in real life. And he actually wrote that in the Mastermind profile 
they actually think about ideas are useful and can be implemented. So now Kurz's version of INTJ focuses on the TE aspect and what TI and what NI looks like with TE because he's concentrating on what the INTJ looks like in terms of their actions outside of their head. Right. Where, whereas where we would conceive about INT, we would speculate more about what goes on in their head. Very difficult to speculate about what, what NI is going on in somebody else's head because it's yeah. like the most personal function. Um, and it's unconscious. Uh, uh, so, so here, whether it is, so if the interest leads back towards the objective data, it's uh, uh, objective and extroverted. If it's just a springboard to further subjective thinking and conceptualization, then it's more introverted. It's just a, because then, because then you, you see you've withdrawn your interest from the yeah. data to within yourself and your own theories. So yeah, uh, whether of course it leads back, Amanda has joined. Hello. Hi. Hi Amanda. Welcome to your debut <laughs> on the channel. Oh, and, I didn't, uh, so seriously, now yeah. that you say that, <laughs> bit of stage fright. Right, so we've got here, so this is a fantastic bit, I'll read this out again for you. I love this bit. Uh, so this is talking about here where, uh, oh, read it out in case you can't see it. It is no proof of the extroverted nature, that's a talking about TE, that it is preoccupied with concrete objects. Since I may be engaging my thoughts with a concrete object, either because I am abstracting my thought from it, so the implications of data, or because I'm concretizing my thoughts with it, say a concrete example of a principle in order to help understand in it. Uh, even if I engage my thinking with concrete things and to that extent could be described as extroverted, it yet remains both questionable and characteristic as regards the direction my thinking will take, namely whether it will further, of course, lead back again to the objective data external facts and generally accepted ideas or not. Whereas, but with the introverted thinker, the fact is just a springboard for their own subjective TI and conceptualization. Right, there we go. And then there's, of course, there's a hell of a lot more on this because Jung he likes to flog this horse and make sure everybody understands. Again, TI, TE will lead back to the facts, yeah. Right, and then we've got something in yellow, it looks like. Uh, so far as the practical thinking of the merchant, the engineer, or the natural science pioneer is concerned, the objective direction is at once manifest. But in the case of the philosopher, it yes, is open it to doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Wherever the course of his thinking is directed towards ideas, in such a case, before deciding, we must further inquire whether these ideas are mere abstractions from objective experience, in which case they would merely represent higher collective concepts comprising a sum of objective facts, or whether if they are clearly not abstractions from immediate experience, they may not be derived from, from tradition or borrowed from the intellectual atmosphere of the time. So again, that's an abstraction based on something that's objective. So a philosopher that has an abstraction that's based on something objective, is not necessarily using introverted thinking because it's just an abstraction of something which is objective and included within that objectiveness is something which is borrowed from society, intellectual atmosphere or ethics of the time. It's still coming from without. So in the latter event, such ideas must also belong to the category of objective data in which case the thinking should also be called extroverted because it's an idea that's based on an external event or as Trey Gowdy says, because I love this new phrase and I keep forgetting it. What is it called? Damn it. There's something, the factual predicate. Yes. It's an <laughs> idea that's, has, that's based on the factual predicate. I love it. In the latter event, uh, should not be called extroverted. Now he gets into TI because he's more interested in it. I will write about it because TI is more interesting. Although I do not propose to prevent the nature of introverted thinking at this point, I will spend the next four pages talking about it. <laughs> reserving Just it for a later like section. <laughs> <laughs> reserving it. So you see what I mean? It's like reserving it for a later section. It is, however, essential that I should make a few statements about it before going further. For if one considers strictly what I have just said concerning 
Jung is a very nuanced thinker, and INCPs love it. They love the nuance, even if it does give them a headache at times. <laughs> right, here we go. Extroverted thinking, one might easily conclude that such a statement includes everything that is generally understood as thinking. Yes, which is how some social science people get into a mess. I might, it might indeed be argued, okay, so the TE viewer TI, it might indeed be argued that a thinking whose aim is concerned neither with objective facts nor with general ideas scarcely merits the name thinking. Yeah, so that's, the, that's the, because they just think, so the TE people just think, yeah, but you're just pulling that out of your backside and, and yeah. rationalizing it. Or, or they'll say, that's just your opinion. That's just, that's not based on evidence, just the facts, yeah. ma'am. <laughs> that's just your opinion. You get a lot of that. <laughs> and of course, the, the, the consistency of the opinion is going to depend on, uh, well, background education and, and raw intelligence. Uh, well, intellectual intelligence, different kind, logical intelligence. Uh, okay. I am fully aware of the fact that the thought of our age, in common with its most eminent representatives, knows and acknowledges only the extroverted type of thinking. So basically here he's complaining about the scientific approach. Right. This is partly due to the fact that all thinking which attains visible form upon the world's surface, whether as science, philosophy or even art, either proceeds directly from objects or flows into general ideas. So Jung is really about TI being, a, being original to the individual, subjective. Not, that's why I don't think, I, I think Jordan Peterson's a TE ego type because he's not telling me anything I've not heard before. <laughs> Whereas mm. with Carl Jung, it's like new idea, new idea, new idea, yeah. new idea. And with, with Jordan Peterson, it's like, yes, I know this. It's like you're not doing it, you're not, there's no originality coming through, in my opinion. Uh, uh, in this sense, it might be said that the extroverted intellect, i.e. the mind that is oriented by objective data, is actually the only one recognized. Yeah, because they think, they think that TI is just opinion, that we're just making yeah. it up. And also because a lot of TI thinking gets refuted. And you got all the TI people mm. arguing with each other. It's like, well, that's just your philosophical opinion. <laughs> right. More than so. that, being an introverted function, yeah. it's hard to express TI without abstracting it through other functions. So you get the fact that a lot of TI users have very clear opinions and axioms and models of how the world works. But it gets reduced to opinion because they, they're not much bothered by the burden of proof, which TE yeah. is very about. I think the burden of proof for INCP is, is how logical and consistent and how elaborate yes, it exactly. is. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's not, and, and that's uh, again linking to the scientific model. The scientific model, even though in, in the field of science we don't talk about proof and disproof, essentially that is what you aim to do and that's what the experimental setup is for. But also there's a, there's a context here is that the INTP scientists, they learn Karl Popper and actually, actually, that's good TI. That's actually, that's a good system. We should actually try to disprove yeah. others. And I quite enjoy disproving this fellow I don't like with his silly <laughs> theories. <laughs> right. Because yeah. I've seen it in, in academia. There is a lot of big egos and people complaining about other people. And they'll say things like, the ultimate insult in academia, I believe his thinking is flawed. <laughs> Working in a lab environment, I've I've been there, and yeah. you guys are frozen on my end. Oh, uh, it should be. Oh, uh, that's a shame. As long as you can hear us, though. Okay, I can hear. Yeah. Just kind of um, weird. <laughs> I mean, that's like telling an SP that they're not awesome, yeah. <laughs> or they've got no flair, <laughs> or an NF that they've got no soul. If you tell an NF that they've got no soul, that's like saying to an NT, "Your thinking is flawed." Especially yeah. to Unless the NF doesn't like the word soul, in which case, replace with subjective. Yeah. yeah. Or you, or, or you have you, you don't have much energy, uh, or there's not. A, <laughs> anyway, we can go to other examples. Uh, so we got here. Um, ah, this is where it gets good. 
There is also, however, and now I come to the question of the introverted intellect because I'm more interested in it, and an entirely different kind of thinking to which I term thinking can hardly be denied. It is the kind that is neither oriented by immediate objective experience, nor is it concerned with general and objectively derived ideas. I reach this other kind of thinking in the following way. When my thoughts are engaged with a concrete object or general idea in such a way that the course of my thinking mm. eventually leads me back again to my object. That's for TE. Oh, yeah, the other kind oh, is, okay, the other kind of thing. Oh, what is done there is, is slightly switched around. But I'm glad I put that note in that, yes, there he's talking about TE because he goes back to the object. When my thoughts are engaged with a concrete object or general idea in such a way that the course of my thinking leads back to the object. Back to the object. Yeah, and this for TI, this, <laughs> this does these things where it does these comparisons in the middle of wicked long sentences. This intellectual process is not only psychic proceeding taking place in me at the moment. Right, this is where it goes a little bit of the control function coming in, where you've got, at the same time you've got TE going on, you've got TI going on, and then he switches it around when he gets to the... So here he's talking about the control TI in the TE DOM. Mm. Uh, this intellectual process is not the only psychic proceeding taking place from it, because otherwise, if it didn't go on, the, the extroverted thinker would be stuck in the data and wouldn't know what to do with it. Uh, uh, in, I will disregard all those possible sensations and feelings which become noticeable as a more or less disturbing accompaniment to my train of thought, Merely uh, emphasizing the fact that this very thinking proceeds, sorry, this very thinking process which proceeds from objective data and strives again towards the object stands also in a constant relation to the subject. This relation is a conditio sine qua non, I think I've wrote down there, an essential condition, a thing that is necessary, without which no thinking, right, uh, right, basically is saying that if you don't have a subjective aspect to extroverted thinking, you're not going to know what to do because you're just basically going to be, as I think Carl Jung wrote, in the power of the facts, the trance of the facts in front of you. You won't interpret it. You need introverted thinking to interpret it. What is the significance of this? Uh, because interpretive is subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could not take place. Even though my think, I see what he's doing here. Is, is showing that TI exists by showing that it also builds off TE by saying that, well, you can't have TE without this bit of TI, and therefore I'm going to talk loads about TI. So even though my thinking process is directed as far as possible towards objective data, nevertheless, it is my subjective process and it can neither escape the subjective admixture nor yet dispense with it. So you see these are these hints towards the control function. Where think, it's the um, go on, Amanda. I think a lot of Jung's uh, ideas and how he's presenting things come from his uh, background as a psychiatrist or someone who worked with um, clinical cases. Yeah. Because here yeah. you see that his model is um, he he talks a lot about how one thing implies another here. So that's sort of a useless side tangent, but. Maybe we can return to that later. But that's what he's done here with TE yep. and TI. Yep. Uh, origin of, I mean, it just shows how it's got very good logic. Shows uh, it's, very, it's super subjective, <laughs> but he's got fantastic logic. And the INTP is all love all the nuances. To such an extent, I'm going to diagram this out. Because a lot of time in his sentences, he does this thing in contrast with this. And I'll do that in the next stage. So, uh, so, so yes, even in objective thinking, there is a subjective admixture because you have to interpret the facts. Exactly. Yeah. Although I try... About... Yeah, go on. Sorry. Normative psychological balance, like the blocks of a functioning human being, and that's where you get functional distortions and all those other things. But... Yeah, I think he writes in the TI section that if you have pure introverted thinking and you don't have any extroverted thinking, your theories are just going to go off into space and you're not going to think about applicability or objective data whereas at some point INTPs will think does this theory work <laughs> mm -hmm. so you gotta Go have that, that bit in there um I don't know, uh, I'll put this bit in purple also fits NITX creative shadow TI right 
Yes, it does. Yes, because um, I was saying with the TE DOM, you've got TI control, but you've also got TI that's used as a tool. I usually see this in the NITX resemblers. That's Kersey INTJ. When they critique other people's logic and say, well, this doesn't follow from this. You have made an error in your logic. So it's almost like mm. they use it uh, as a weapon against other to criticize rather than use it to build up a theory. So that, that again, it fits in with their uh, cliche of them being the critic. So uh, they're, they're very good at finding logical inconsistencies, INTJs uh, and ITX. Was Although I try my utmost to give a completely objective direction to my train of thought, even then I cannot exclude the parallel subjective process, which is which it's in all embracing participation without extinguishing the very spark of life from my thought. So if you were to speak to Carl Jung here, you're saying, look, come on, mate. Look, you are talking about shadow functions here. These are shadow functions. And you are saying that it's very much present in the mind of the thinking dominant, where this opposite side is very much there in, in the mind. Um, oh, there, here we go. Although I try my utmost to give a completely objective direction to my train of thought, even then I cannot exclude the parallel subjective process with its all-embracing participation without extinguishing the very spark of life from my thoughts because you'd just be stuck with data. You wouldn't know what to mm -hmm. do with it. Uh, this parallel subjective process has a natural tendency only relatively avoidable to subjectify the objective facts, i.e. to assimilate them to the subject. Yes, that's the thing, because you fit your fact. So the TEDOM will fit their facts into their, into their knowledge base of things, and their knowledge base is going to be subjective. Uh, uh, what else have I written at the side? Uh, nobody was better at talking about NE and NI and TI, the NT functions than Carl Jung. It wasn't necessarily the best at FE and FI, but it was great at, at, at the T and the N. Um, Right, okay, uh, assimilate them into the object. I just wondered what I put there. Oh, yeah, covered in other areas. Right then, so... Whenever the... Ch here we go, here we go. So, again, value is coming in. Whenever the chief value is given to the subjective process, that other kind of thinking arises which stands opposed to extroverted thinking, namely purely subjective orientation of thought, which I have termed introverted. A thinking arises from this other orientation that is neither determined by objective facts nor directed towards objective data. A thinking, therefore, that proceeds from subjective data and is directed towards subjective ideas or facts of the subjective character. And because it is like this and because it hasn't got facts, to, the only thing it can use to is reason, laws of reason and internal consistency and logic. Is a, is, is, is a part of this. The problem that socionics gets into is it defines TI as the logic and internal consistency. And Jung mm. writes about rational function. Thinking, introverted thinking is only rational insofar as it is in accordance with the laws of reason. So it's almost as if socionics TI is defining the laws of reason rather than defining what people do in real life, subjective thinking which may or may not be logically fantastic because even the INTPs have faults in their logic at times or maybe use the wrong premise or go off the, or oh, miss the point. Exactly that, exactly that. And that's why you have with TI and X resemblers, that's why you have the any and with TI SX resembles, resemblers, that's why you have the SC, the extroverted perceiving to fact check to have an extroverted balance to it. But on its own, TI is given to creating logic in a vacuum more yeah. than anything else. So you start from a premise and you create something. And if you don't have that reality check, say, oh, am I considering all of these other things? Then you're going to go helplessly adrift in your own ideas. And yeah. you might turn to someone who's got more of a grasp on the reality of things than you. Be like, what the hell are you talking about? Please translate back to human. Yeah, you got that <laughs> with the German idealists, where they were with the metaphysics and where they were talking about things beyond physics. 
and it's like and then you've got Kant coming on and I go oh well I would just you call that TI look at this well actually we don't call it <laughs> TI because Jung's not lived yet but you call that logic oh, look at this so he's he's got meta TI in that he knows the limits of it it's just like I think that when someone's got really good FI they're really self-aware about their own baggage and can put it to one side and when they make an evaluation yeah. of somebody else and when they read yeah. them because Jung wrote about the ego can get in the way and when the ego gets in the way FI is severely compromised in terms of what in terms of empathizing with people and reading character and that's the thing from this book any grammar NLP about being in a fair witness position so when yeah. an INFP is healthy they can read people really well but if they've got baggage right you can get projection right rather than what when uh, they've got the empathy thing and then oh, i'll talk about that in another one because i'd like oh, talked about it in the fi stuff <laughs> uh, i'm always banging on about ti and fi <laughs> certain functions the introverted are, judging yeah, functions yeah. are so fascinating to me yeah so and, fascinating and even si i did three hangouts with Dario and Victor on it, and we never really got to solve the problem in the end of it. Because you know me, I wanted it to be nice and integrated. I wanted it, I wanted a nice TI structure. I wanted integration with Kersey and Dario yes, and Linda. Yeah, you wanted it all to match up. Yeah, I wanted it all to match up. And yeah, yeah, and it's like I know why. <laughs> and it's like when I read Victor's profiles, I know why he's put certain things in because it's so it's fits in with this whole system. Like that's in there because of your mindset. It's I little P and because of that, it's this. And because of that, it's this. And these little things that all line up. Oh, that's in there because you've defined the charge like this. So sometimes, exactly. sometimes you get the, in my opinion, the functional tail wagging the dog. But other mm. times that subjective thinking leads to really good insights. Especially if you have somebody more extroverted thinking, uh, objective than you are. To bounce it out right so shalina mm. do you wish to say anything <laughs> no i'm just listening to y'all okay here we go so <laughs> I, I'll, I'll... I hate to disappoint but i actually have to leave now so I'll oh you no but you, 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 i've you... got an exam to write okay oh well, well, that is a fantastic <laughs> excuse dropping it thank you for your <laughs> okay. first um appearance thank you amanda right bye bye goodbye yeah there we go honestly man i just te is that this is about TI, right? I don't know. T, the T functions for me are a little bit boring, but especially extroverted thinking is just a, extremely a snooze fest. So, well, that's why he's talking about TI instead. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I agree with Young. Like this, <laughs> it's boring. Yes. Um, <laughs> the only thing that's good about TE is in ter when you get in terms of practicality in the world and getting stuff done in of terms course. of business logic right uh, things like that so an enfj resembler can learn to use stuff in terms of just getting things organized and and mm -hmm. raquel came up with a raquel buchanan professional counselor she's an enfj resembler mm -hmm. she um she was writing things for entj women to help entj women and because she did that people thought that she was an entj female but it was just that she had developed the things that we associate with TE, like professionalism and business acumen and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. I'm not bad at TE. In fact, I'm in the middle of writing a business plan right. for my individual spiritual business or whatever. Right. I just don't like to talk about the like specifics right. of it. Like it's boring. Yeah. But that's <laughs> the thing. That's the thing where it's the role function in ENTJ and the ESFJ where it's just boring. It's just something we can do. We can go into that role. Mm -hmm. We're not really weak at it, but we can go into that role because it's mm -hmm. it's just the other side of the overall Galenko temperament. Mm -hmm. I don't call it temperament because I don't want to mix it up with Kersey. I call it mindset because the right. overall mindset is extroverted, judging, linear, mm -hmm. assertive. I'm going to organize this world, preferably along FE lines. But I can also do it with TE in order to get FE aims achieved. Yeah, yeah. It's just reading all the information about it is a bit... Like, <laughs> yeah, it's boring. It's factual. It's boring, yeah. So determined by objective facts, nor directed towards objective data. Thinking, therefore, is perceived towards subjective data, introduced towards subjective ideas or facts 
of a subjective character. Right, so basically, it's subjective. I think you said subjective enough that people should get it. Yeah. Uh, it's perceived some subject. So it's very, so it's very much, so uh, a lot of TI is very much like opinion. Because with opinion, people take a premise and then, well, that's a lot of, t a lot of TI. And so the TI users, well, that's just your opinion. What are the facts? Yeah. So a TI is very much like opinion. It is. And this yeah. is why also extroverted feeling types, we suppress our opinions so as to not hurt other people. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, that's why I mean, the most flexible one in terms of that large kind of logic is ENTP. I mean, mm -hmm. they study philosophy and they don't like to like any universals, things like that. Uh, an example of an ENTP philosopher is um, not, not the bottom, but the guy, I listened because he used to do for Pete, used to stand in, sit in for Peter Schiff. Uh, mm -hmm. Stefan Molyneux, I think ENTP, like he doesn't like talking about natural rights. He talks about UPBs, universal preferable behaviors. Whereas I'm like, no, no, there are natural rights. A human being has a right to defend themselves. If they exactly. do not have a right to defend themselves, they are an object. If you're a person, you have a right to defend yourself. And what that then does, that then puts the right to defend yourself above freedom of speech. Because you don't then have the freedom to threaten somebody and yeah. then claim it's speech. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, it is speech. It's just yeah. not speech you agree with. But because when you then start... So do you think that's true, that the individual, each person, intrinsic in the concept of a person, is the right for that person to defend themselves? Huh? Yeah. Otherwise, they're an object owned by somebody else that anyone, that, that anyone can do anything to. No, I agree with you. No. I agree with it. I was yeah. just saying it I is. Just, I just think it's within the concept of a person. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, it's just, and even in the past, if you killed a slave, you got in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, but then when you take that principle, you have the right to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Then we start getting towards the Second Amendment. People have the right to defend yourself, but then other principles come in. Yes, mm -hmm. but you also have duty of care. You have the right to defend yourself, but duty of care says you better learn how to shoot straight. Yeah. Therefore, you should go on this course on gun right. safety. Yeah. And then maybe say, and maybe you shouldn't be an alcoholic. Or if you've got these. <laughs> so you see these, when you proceed from natural rights, and this is where, and this is like, Kant maybe got a little bit like this, where INTPs, we don't get declarative with TI, but we sure as hell get declarative with ethics. <laughs> it's like, because of yeah. this, therefore this, this, and this. Mm hmm so it's like, I will take that, like that premise. A human being has a right to defend themselves. And it's like this, 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 and this. And it's like, <laughs> INTPs can get like that. And then they get unnuanced in their ability to apply force because they become too black or white hardcore. Right. Je Jefferson got like that with the Barbary Coast pirates, uh, the Islamic pirates that were pirating American ships. And so he when he was president, he decided to send over the Marines to North Africa. So it's like INTP, he tried, he tried to be accommodating. He tried to be accommodating at first, like negotiate with them. But yeah. the pirates were like, hey, we can rob for you. You're not Muslims. So I'm it's here. all written. It's all written. It's, like, it's, it's sort of called uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Tripoli Pirates. Something like that was a, it came out. But yeah, so INTPs might not make the best president because they might be too black and white they might think this country is going to be a threat let's nuke them now because <laughs> like if you can see so for instance the INTP president might think i think we need to destroy iran now before yeah. they get a nuclear bomb you see what i mean because they don't handle pressure well and they can see what's mm -hmm. coming in the future yeah so but anybody else who just think you're being way too drastic yeah no we can see what's going to happen so like i said so you can see there that the use of force is not as nuanced. <laughs> Do you as... think that ISFJs can be a bit um, pessimistic as far as future oh, possibilities yes. like that as well? Oh, yes. Kersey calls them the protector. Mm -hmm. So they, they uh, focused on health. In fact, it says that they're more interested in somebody when they're ill than when they're well. Yeah, And he also says that they go towards the roles, not just of like, say, the nurturing roles, but they mm -hmm. also go towards the role of nurse and doctor and mm -hmm. insurance person. 
because there, there is that tendency to protect. And then from yeah. a functional point of view with Victor, he would say that uh, SI minus, minimizing discomfort. Mm -hmm. And Carl Jung would say, because I looked at the SI DOM type, said that mm -hmm. with that inferior uh, NE, it has an archaic character that sees negative possibilities all over where and where things right. can go wrong. So that's three justifications. That's three answers for you. One from Victor, one from Kersey, and one from Young. So do you think, with the example you just gave, I think of the INTP president, do you think that the ISFJ can resemble the INTP in so far as we need to hurry up and do this before somebody? Because with the yeah. ISFJ, it's more about the pessimistic, uh, yeah, not, so mean, much, not so much being in tune with the actual possibilities, but just leaning more over to the pessimistic side of possibilities. Yeah, I mean, they can be overly defensive, and you get that with SJs. Now, I, I heard a conversation where, and they showed a, a conversation between JFK and Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower told, and, and JFK was asking Eisenhower for advice. Eisenhower suggested that he actually bomb Cuba. <laughs> Not a good idea, because the Soviet soldiers in Cuba were under orders that if they were to attack, they were mm -hmm. attacked, they would launch their... ICBMs, right. So although it's not really in consequence, but ballistic missiles from Cuba, and but he handled that very well, Kennedy, and he made a deal behind the scenes that made it look like Khrushchev had backed down. But the behind the scenes deal was, okay, if you take your missiles out from Cuba, we'll take our missiles out from Turkey. But because that was done a bit as a secret deal. Kennedy knew that on the surface it would look like he won. Right. But in terms of the optics, but Khrushchev was think, well, I'm the one who's won because it's got taken, they got taken, these missiles got taken out of Turkey. But mm -hmm. he was calm under pressure, was JFK. And that advice from Eisenhower, if he'd have followed it, that would have started World War Three. Right. So I give, I give Kennedy a lot of credit just for the Cuban Missile Crisis and the way he handled it. Because that's a big thing to get right. Yeah. So I give him a lot of credit for that. So again, that's the, the good side of the artisan temperament. Calm under pressure. Yeah. Right then. I do not wish to enter full into this kind of thinking here. Yes, you do. You do wish to enter into that kind of thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do not wish to enter more full into this kind of thinking here. I have merely established things. That, yeah, but then you can. Uh, does he continue with it? I think he does stop with it. I do not wish to enter more fully into this kind of thinking here. I have merely established its existence for the purpose of giving a necessary complement to extroverted thinking process, whose nature is thus brought to clearer focus. Okay. Right. So th this is still gets interesting when he writes about this, uh, because uh, still a little bit more. Here we go. Uh, we might stop at the end of this page. I don't know how much time you have left. Shalina. Okay, well, I'm kind of tired. Yeah, yeah, so we'll <laughs> stop it. Right, so this is a, a good point to stop because I'm about uh, I'm at the end. We'll just do this final paragraph. Okay. And then we can stop because then I'll know that where I'm up to. Uh, okay. When the objective orientation receives a certain predominance, the thinking is extroverted. This circumstance changes nothing as regard the logic of thought. It merely determines that difference between thinkers, which James regards as a matter of temperament. Right. So, yeah, William James. Actually, he was a good philosopher. It was a good... Uh, uh, Kersey liked William James a lot. He wrote stuff about psychology. Um, so that's the thing. The socialist definition of TI is too mm -hmm. much towards logic, but logic is just thinking in general. Well, yeah. good, good thinking in general. Right. <laughs> High quality thinking in general. You're mm -hmm. not actually defining TI in itself. Uh, and frequently TJs, TE ego types, T, uh, TE obviously auxiliaries, frequently they're into business, but TE is not identical with business logic. Right. Business logic is just a species of TE. Uh huh. Right. Uh, this circumstance changes nothing in regards to logic of thought. It merely determines the difference between thinkers, which James regards as well. So basically, TE, TE people are logical, TI people are logical. Yeah. But with the TE people, there is a factual predicate, my new favorite phrase, 
Uh, yeah. With the TI people, there's usually a concept going on or uh, an idea, even with ISTP, an idea, an inkling of let's try this. Let's try this thing to solve the problem. And doing things their own way in a utilitarian method, not by the book, so subjective. By the book would be objective. Orientation towards the object, as already explained, makes no essential change in the thinking function. Only appearance is altered. Always getting an advantage. Or nuanced here. Orientation towards the... Yeah, it depends whether it then goes back to it. Orientation towards the object as... Oh, right, as... Uh, uh, Oh, essential. Oh, he means the logical part of it. There's no essential change in the logic of it. The orientation towards the object, as already explained, makes no essential change <coughs> in the thinking function. Only its appearance is altered. Since it is governed by objective data, it has the appearance of being captivated by the object right. as though without the external orientation, it simply could not exist. Something like that. So there we go. So... Uh, so basically, they come off like they're like overly dependent on, on the object. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll look like, and this is why some people in MBTI, and why, especially if you don't know temperament, it's like they can get confused between SE and TE. Yeah, they I both deal with factual. Yeah, I used stuff. to get mixed up between SE, TI, and TE. Yeah, well, I think TE, as I said, it's like it's objective, but it's also got a logic to it, and then yeah. of course. When we bring temperament in and hold tight, mm -hmm. well, we got TE in the in the STJs is different from TE in the NTJs because you got TE with NI, so yeah. again strategic planning, long term goals, and then mm -hmm. TE with SI where you get more procedural logic, standard operating procedure kind of stuff. So I put some notes on here. So um, in my humble opinion, this is present in NITX resemblers, especially when they are, go deep in thought. So this is about the INTJs. Mm -hmm. And the idea here that they've got strong, unvalued TI right. in, uh, in the INTJ. Because like I said, you argue with one. They're pretty good mm -hmm. at pointing out holes in your argument. So, yeah, uh, wait a minute. I've not... <laughs> I should have... <laughs> I've been going through this. I should have had that on screen uh, all along. I was, I was reading it out. So there you go, folks. I'll uh, put that on screen. Because I, I accidentally clicked on your square uh and then i should, I should that's going to be on the board so that need to show that there you go folks uh then uh i'll just get in this on screen and then uh there we go okay did that uh we did it over here i think yeah it does a good job sounding intp yes it does a very good job of sounding intp i actually saw that though so oh, what <laughs> what did you say that what you said, you didn't put it on screen, but you actually what, did. Uh, well, I did for you, but it's just, but the thing is, oh. what, ha what happens is the, the square that I click on is the one that oh. appears on the recording. Right. And so I, I clicked on the one to see you, to see your okay. reaction, and right. that's the one whereas the audience wouldn't then see that. Because I've got to remember that because sometimes I lose. So it's like doing multiple things at the, <laughs> at the oh, same no. time. So yeah, these are just some of my notes. T E T I does a goblin sound of INTP, also fits INTJ. So you've got a little bit there with the opposing personality, as people would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just see if there are any overall notes before we finish uh, that I've written on the pages. Uh, again, yeah, it, the idea that it will lead back. So the T E thinker will lead back to the objective data. Uh, something about Austrian school economics. Oh, yeah, the intellectual atmosphere of the time. Uh, and then, oh, yes, the oh, this is a big thing, big thing. Everyone in economics who goes to university and learns economics are not mm -hmm. learning real economics. They're learning stupid economics called Keynesianism. And mm -hmm. there's an example of stupid extroverted logic. And if they had more intelligence, in my opinion, they would work out that the, the, the aggregate demand is bullshit. And that mm -hmm. inflation does not equal aggregate demand but you cannot print production so i'm gonna uh, pretend like i understand what you're talking about. yeah well, well there was a future hangouts when the us US dollar collapses and i'll say oh bloody well told you so and that's why i've got peter schiff and ludwig von mises on the wall so yeah keith schiff uh i'll write about tia because it's more interesting well, we agree with that uh and then there was we did this bit earlier on the subjective factor again 
the laws of logic are not necessarily deflected since it's one-sidedness lies in the premise. And you could also say, because we haven't got the factual data to rely on like a crutch, we tend to focus on the logic more because our premises can be so tenuous. Right. So that tends to happen with people who are more conceptual because you want people to follow along with the logic. So I think we've pretty much gone through everything and I've got to remember where we finished. We finished on that bit. And so there will be a part two, folks. There will be a part two. Okay. So back to Shalina, who is now in darkness. Yeah. And I'll say, so Shalina, how has your first video been? I don't know. It's, I like the interactions. As long as I don't focus on how ugly I'm looking at the camera, then I'll be okay. <laughs> well, you know, uh, fishing for compliments, folks. She looks fine to me. Right then. So it's goodbye from me. Okay. And it's, and it's thank goodbye. you for this, by the way. I enjoyed okay. it. Oh, thank you. I'm going to stop, stop, stop the broadcast, but it will continue.